Hello, everyone, and a big welcome to this April edition of World Athletics webinar. Tonight, we've got an amazing program. Really excited to be discussing running in the city. We've got an amazing panel of, of speakers from across the globe uh, and some great insights we're going to share. For those of you that don't know me, I'm Chris Robb. I'm the CEO and founder of Mass Participation World. Delighted to be your host again tonight in what's going to be a, another packed uh, two and a bit hour program. So just a little bit of housekeeping. As normal with a webinar, the way to communicate is either in the chat or the Q&A. Welcome your input as we go through. Please feel free to put those in. We'll curate them. As I said, I've got a screen down here in front of me. I've got Oliver in the studio helping, and we'll do our best to try and curate questions and comments that you might have. Um, as I mentioned, it's about a two hour, just over a two hour program, and we'll do our best to run to time there, uh, as packed as it is, but some, some really great insights. We are live streaming on Facebook, as we always do. Uh, delighted uh, to also have Facebook on the panel tonight. We'll be me meeting Ben Burchuk in a short while. And we're also delighted to once again be live streaming into China. A big thank you to Julia Chui, Jerry and Huao from the CGX management team in Beijing that are live streaming us there. We are also recording and uh, the, the recording will be available. You could obviously access it on the live stream on Facebook, but the recording will be uploaded to MPW Academy and on our Facebook page in due course as well. Um, and uh, the, uh, the, we have a number of slide presentations tonight. They will be available. Uh, we'll send a link out afterwards, and you can download those um, and, uh, and, 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 and follow up if you need to, if there's anything that you've missed. Uh, a, a quick mention of the, the new MPW initiative, which started a couple of weeks ago, MPW Global Updates. We had the second version of that on Tuesday night, a 15-minute live on Facebook and LinkedIn, uh, and then turned into a podcast and shared and today's one uh, last Tuesday's one a couple of days ago is now up um, and available so quickly let's skip through the pa uh, the program for tonight and let's then quickly as as possible get underway so we can get into the meat of the program first up we will be exploring the role of social media in creating vibrant running cities and be delighted to welcome Ben Burchak who uh, looks after sports partnerships at Meta who's joining us out of New York uh, and he's got some amazing case studies studies that he's going to be sharing of events that Meta has been working with in that space. We then move on to um, urban marathons, rhythms and places of, of mobility. Um, and we will welcome Professor Jonas Larson, who is going to be, he's a professor of mobility and urban studies at Roskilde University, uh, which is near Copenhagen in Denmark. And then we have a panel which I, am, I will be moderating and hosting. We have a fantastic selection of guests on that panel. And we will be discussing what makes a running city. And uh, Professor Larson will continue uh, from his presentation to join us on that. We will then be joined uh, and we have great, a great academic um, group here as well as people involved in implementing policy and delivering events and the like. Dr. Sarah McBride-Stewart, Reader in Health and Medicine and Society at the School of Social Sciences at Cardiff University. Dr. Charlotte Brookfield, Senior Lecturer in Social Sciences at the School of Social Sciences and also at Cardiff University. Delighted to welcome, and I just saw him logged on as we went live, Ted Metellus, uh, Vice President of New York Roadrunners and, of course, the Race Director of the TCS New York Marathon. Be delighted to hear his insights. And literally just a great sign of the times, I think. I saw a photo this morning of Mr. Lim Tech Yin, the CEO of Sports Singapore in London. He's just recently, a few hours ago, landed back in Singapore, and he'll be joining us in his role as CEO of Sports Singapore. And then once we have that panel, we move on to an introduction to the World Athletics Sustainable Events Management System for Label Races. And that'll be a presentation by Bob Ramsack, the head of sustainability at World Athletics, uh, who will be joining us from Monaco. And then we wrap it up with a, a, a fantastic interview, which uh, we pre-recorded uh, a couple of days ago. It's called City of Opportunities, the Ethiopian Elite Runners Mindsets. Um, it's a conversation 
conversation between Dr. Michael Crawley, social anthropologist at Durham University in the UK, and he's in conversation with Alessio Punzi, road running manager of World Athletics, who I'm sure doesn't need much interruption. But let's get uh, to the top of the program. That's enough from me. A quick reminder again, say hello in the chat, put your questions in the chat or the Q&A uh, as I welcome our first guest of this evening to present on the role of social media in creating vibrant running cities. Please welcome Ben Burchuk, Sports Partnerships at Meta, joining us from New York. Nice to see you, Ben, and over to you. Thank you, Chris. Uh, thank you, Mass Participation World. Thank you for having me. Um, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Um, it's a lovely morning here in New York, and I appreciate, uh, I appreciate that you allowed a cyclist on this, uh, this running panel. Um, but thrilled to, to be with everybody, thrilled to talk about how running cities, running organizations um, are able to take advantage of Meta's suite, Meta's family of apps, um, to build vibrant communities, distribute content, and all the ways we're, we're seeing great partners do that in this space. It's the examples, the case studies I'm going to run through are a little bit US centric. Um, just from the seat that I sit in, uh, you know, we have great partners at New York Roadrunners. As Chris mentioned, you'll hear from Ted later. Um, but plenty of plenty of properties around the world. Um, great to see Singapore on. I know they've done quite a few live streams of the marathon as well on Facebook. So these these case studies, these tools are certainly applicable to to everybody around the world. Please drop questions in. Would love to answer some questions at the end if you have them. Um, and with that, I will get started. So when we talk about sport on Facebook, I just want to level set at a macro level first before diving into to running and fitness. Um, we really like to think of Facebook and Meta and Instagram as the world's largest stadium. You know, there's over 700 million sports fans on Facebook. These are people that follow sport organizations, athletes, brands. And we're getting close to that number on Instagram as well with over 500 million sports fans. In addition, there are billions of people who consume sports and fitness related content on Facebook and Instagram. Over a billion people use, you know, watching content on Facebook watch and over 800 million people interacting with live content on Facebook and Instagram. And dialing in a little deeper into the fitness world, these are numbers that we're able to publicly share and we're, we're labeling this as fitness, but this includes organizations, athletes, brands in this space, we basically have a taxonomy where we've identified partners across the, the ecosystem from running to cycling to all sorts of participatory disciplines. And as you can see, this, the numbers here are still massive. You know, Over 170 million people follow what we term fitness-related accounts on Facebook and 120 million on Instagram. So you have an incredibly large addressable audience of not just participants, but fans of these sports, fans of these disciplines, fans of these city-based organizations um, with which to target, with which to interact with, with which to build communities. And a few stats um, in the lower half of this page that I think are really interesting. We, we did some analysis about a year ago, just of the impact of COVID and, and what it had had on clearly the industry, but also the impact on social media and digital media and, and fitness, endurance, running, um, these type of disciplines really had exploded across our platforms as people were at home, um, consuming content in new ways, finding themselves with more time for, for new hobbies. And so I know we, we've all you know, had struggles and events have been canceled. A lot of activity um, has moved online, and, and we've seen some positive impacts of that that I think can continue um, as we return to normal with in real life events. But you can see here, there were more Facebook Live, more Instagram Live videos being created related to running, working out, and fitness um, since the start of the pandemic, which again, I think despite all the negatives, there are some positive signs. So I'm going to dive into now a couple of the key products that we have that can really help city-based organizations with their running events, show some marathon case studies, talk about groups, talk about live, talk about some of the different content formats that we've seen from some of the great partners around the world. So first up is groups. 
You may be familiar with Facebook groups, but this is really one of our, our superpowers. It's the way that people with like-minded interests, shared interests, come together, create community, share tips, you know, meet, meet in real life, make connections. Um, it's a great way that, uh, that, that properties and city-based running organizations can engage directly with their, their communities. So got a great example here from, from my hometown, New York Roadrunners. Um, this is an official Facebook group that they host and manage. So you're able to control the membership, uh, set rules and guidelines for participation in the community, and then engage directly um, with the people who, who are members. You can post exclusive content, potentially give them benefits, you know, early sign up for races uh, or, or access to coaches chats. Um, but groups, what we really see, this is a really interesting stat, is that there are more groups dedicated to running and marathons than there are related to NBA basketball. And that's in the United States. So clearly the, the sports with participatory natures drive a lot of conversation, drive a lot of fandom, drive a lot of passion, even more so in some cases than professional properties. And what we also find is that groups related to running, particularly ones started by city-based organizations, have what we call meaningful members. So these are people that don't just join the group, but they're posting, they're commenting, they're sharing their own workouts, their own stories. And so it's a really vibrant place for conversation and to take a pulse of, of your community. On a similar vein, we also see organic groups popping up. So these are, these are groups that are not started necessarily by the city, by the running organization, but they're just started by, by runners themselves. Uh, they're, they're, you know, anybody can start a group. Uh, anybody can set their own rules and, and have followings. And um, we see these often pop up around race preparation. You know, I'm training for the New York Marathon. I'm training for the Paris Marathon. Um, and, and this is a great way that our platform, again, extends the reach, extends the opportunity for city-based organizations to activate and to reach their fans and audience. You see examples here for, for the Rock and Roll Marathon series. You know, these, these are groups that have been started independent of the organizing body, the governing body, and they're localized to the different cities and events on the calendar. And what's really great about these is that while you are not in control of this group as an organization, you can still join the group. You can still reach out to these members. You can say, hey, you know, official account here, um, be sure to sign up for this or be sure to check out our training plan for this race. So you have a two-pronged approach when it comes to groups of being able to both host an official communication channel and have people signing up um, you know, to your official group. But then you can also monitor the Facebook landscape for these unofficial groups that are started often by you know, super fans, people doing training, um, and drop in there as well. So you have two avenues to really tap into communities and groups um, on Facebook. So turning from groups to the content side, what's really wonderful about our platforms and other digital and social platforms as well is just they open up new avenues to produce all sorts of different content formats and genres across the running world. Clearly at the core, uh, there's the live races and events and workouts and training, but we see great examples of all different types of ancillary content coming from city-based running organizations um, around instruction, training, how to, you know, nutrition, various features and stories. Um, and while linear television is clearly limited to the amount of shelf space and time um, it can devote to, to running programming, you, know, you have an endless calendar, uh, an endless time slot that is not uh, beholden to a 24-7, 365 uh, schedule of television. And so I'm going to go through some, some examples um, in the following slides, but I think one of the key messages is, and one of the things we see is that the more things that you try and experiment with as a city-based running organization through social media, um, you're going to get a great response from your audience, both in terms of viewing the content, consuming that content, but then leading to joining a, a group, like I mentioned, then leading to signing up 
um, for your races or events. And so content really is one of the key pieces um, on that journey to building new fans, driving new race registrations and the like. At the core of content distribution um, for running cities on Facebook, it is really the live stream of pro race coverage. Um, again, a great example from, from our friends at New York Roadrunners on this. I know for years they've been providing coverage of both the half marathon and the marathon on their Facebook page. Um, what's unique about the Facebook platform is that you are fully in control over your broadcast. You can do a full global distribution, um, you know, reach, reach up to billion, you know, the billions of people that are on Facebook, go live, no restrictions or depending on the broadcast deals you have in place, you can geogate your, your live coverage to select markets or regions. In the case with New York Roadrunners, uh, the coverage on Facebook is actually non-exclusive because in New York, they have a local deal with, uh, with ABC in the New York DMA designated market area. They also have a national deal here with ESPN in the States and then global deals around the world. So, you know, again, very flexible in terms of the type of coverage being offered for the pro race uh, that often has you know, the most television deals or other deals attached to it. But again, the benefit of the Facebook platform for, for live streaming for, for a city-based organization is that while the television exposure is wide and, and great, um, on Facebook, you get that real-time interaction with your viewers. You're able to, to comment, share, you're able to hear from people, um, what they like about the race, what they would want to see more of, cheering on runners, family, friends. Um, and so there's that real-time element that, that allows both the, the city-based organization, but also their sponsors to, to engage with the fan base directly. Another aspect of live streaming coverage, and something that we've really been, been pushing on for the past few years, is to not just cover the pro race field, but to, to really cover the full field if possible, or, or at minimum, add a finish line camera. Um, it, it is costly to cover uh, a full race. We, 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 we understand that, um, the challenges of covering um, you know, a 26-mile course or a 13-mile course. But a finish line camera is a really low-cost production where even just a single fixed camera, um, it can be hosted with talent or it can just be you know, that static feed running. But what we see is oftentimes on Facebook, the finish line camera may even drive more engagement in the form of likes, comments, shares than even the pro race coverage. And that's because, you know, friends, family, training partners, people's personal connections are really invested in their success and, and really want to tune in to see um, their loved one or their training partner complete this milestone. And so we've got we've got some great examples here, both the, the LA Marathon, the Con Conquer Endurance Group um, has done quite a bit of content on their Facebook page, uh, ha has done a finish line for a few years running. And then the Rock and Roll Series, again, I, I go to them uh, with this example from Las Vegas. The Las Vegas event is really unique because up until, I guess, the Formula One announcement last week, I believe the Rock and Roll Las Vegas Marathon was the only event that shuts down the strip. And so they wanted to capitalize on that unique position, use their Facebook page, partner with the city of Las Vegas to let every person who was crossing that finish line have their moment, uh, their star moment, and, and cover that as if it was you know, the finish line of the pro race at the New York City Marathon. Another great piece of content that can come out of this that will drive, I think we've seen it drive some great you know, PR and, and comms stories, is that final finisher story spotlight that you can get from a finish line camera. And again, I'll reference New York, New York Roadrunners, um, the 2019 New York City Marathon. They had some amazing coverage at the end um, on their Facebook page, you know, showing those final finishers crossing um, late at night. And it got some great pickup and stories coverage from ESPN and, and other news outlets as well. And so while not the, you know, the, the focus of, of the core you know, professional runner, um, Facebook gives you an opportunity as a city-based organization to really showcase everybody who's come out to your race, give them a spotlight, and for a low cost but high return, um, really offer coverage of, of the full field. 
coaching and instruction is another great format and, and one we've seen partners really innovate and particularly over the past few years, deliver more content from this vertical in the form of live and video on demand workout series. Um, Mike, I mentioned previously, you know, nutrition, other highlights. This is a great way to kind of have an always on presence on your Facebook page when it's not race season, you know, keep people um, engaged throughout the calendar year, make sure they, they know the key events that are coming up, the key dates to have to sign up for your events. Um, and not let your Facebook or Instagram accounts go dormant um, in the off season. Another great way to activate um, in this kind of vertical, this coaching instructional vertical is to partner with your sponsors. Facebook has a branded, Facebook and Instagram have branded content tools that allow you to tag your sponsors in that content. And again, those are deals you do completely off platform. You have a sponsorship, you sell it for however amount you're keeping all that revenue. You know, Facebook or Instagram does not touch that revenue. Um, you're merely just activating and providing more exposure. And so you can see this example here, New York Roadrunners partnering with the Hospital for Special Surgery on some tips. Um, again, that exposure for, for a partner is something that, that Roadrunners or any city organization can then go back um, and, and hopefully leverage for more sponsorship dollars in, in the next go around. And a final format that has really grown over the past few years um, that's been quite interesting to follow is, is this concept of virtual racing. Really evolved over COVID. You know, there, there certainly were some city-based organizations doing versions of this um, previously. Um, but what we've seen is particularly when events were canceled in real life events couldn't be held, um, organizations using their Facebook and Instagram pages to host virtual racing events, virtual marathons, virtual triathlons, um, extending those events to participants, not just in their home city, but around the world who may want to, you know, virtually participate um, in the London Marathon, in the New York City Marathon, um, in the Singapore Marathon. And what's been, what's been really interesting to see about these is, again, you know, we were surprised and thrilled because you don't expect this you know, type of content format to necessarily perform as well um, if it's you know, amateurs running versus watching the pros, but the response to people seeing their friends and family participate from their basements on their treadmills at home um, has really been fantastic. And again, it's a very low cost way to light up content on your page. It's not a full production. You're not you know, having to send, send trucks and, and motorbikes out on a race course. You can do this with remote cameras from select people's homes. And then what we're seeing also is that the, the, the city running organizations are then able to convert people who have participated in the virtual events into participants in real life events and signing up for races um, as the world fortunately has, has come back more to normal and races are back on the calendar. In terms of resources and um, you know, things you have access to, um, I would point you to three areas. One, we have a fitness hub um, dedicated to best practices for fitness-based organizations. And again, as I mentioned at the top, that includes, you know, running organizations, instructors, athletes, talent, brands. It, it's sort of a wide spectrum that we've lumped under the, the fitness banner, but it's certainly applicable to um, running organizations, to, to instructors, to, to anyone um, on this call today. If you're interested specifically in live streaming, some of those examples, we have a, a, a live sports production guide um, on the web as well, publicly available with best practices, everything from the technical specs and that side to examples and how to make your content more social, how to engage in the comments, how to make your, your production Facebook and Instagram first, not just taking a television feed um, and putting it on social. And then finally, we have an overall um, sports playbook and sports hub that's applicable to, to, you know, best practices applicable to using all of our platforms and tools, and not just for, for live streaming, but, but getting started on Facebook and Instagram, building groups, building audiences, and case studies for um, partners outside of the, the sports organization. On the fitness hub, you'll see case studies specific to um, fitness participatory sports on the sports hub. Um, you'll see case studies from a, a wide range of professional um, properties from, from around the world. 
So these are three resources, again, like Chris mentioned, um, this will be posted. Um, we would love for, for you all to take advantage of these and we look forward to seeing more great content um, coming from the running world uh, to our platforms in the future. I'm happy to take questions if there, there's time um, and thank you everybody for joining us today. Thanks so much, Ben. Some some fantastic insights there in, in a short period of time. And uh, yeah, amazing what you said there. More running Facebook groups than NBA basketball groups. Isn't, isn't that amazing? I love the part about the uh, the camera, uh, a fixed camera, cheap cost. And, and it was kind of backed up by Steve Fleck there in the comments as an announcer. He announces events all over Canada and the US saying one of his biggest joys is bringing that last uh, p participant across the line. The opportunity for people to sit in their homes uh, the engagement that events are, are potentially creating around that. And, and in a time when we're so challenged um, financially and commercially at the moment as an industry looking for new revenue streams, you spoke about you know, this opportunity to commercialize your feeds. Is that only just a quick question as time is tight, but are you seeing that only as the bigger events? You put up a, a New York Roadrunners example, but are you seeing some of the smaller events monetizing that as well? No, absolutely. Um events of all sizes from all over the world. The, the, these kind of examples and best practices are, are applicable to any partner. Um, and again, because we have that global audience, you can find fans, runners, family members, people who are interested in this content, no matter where they are in the world. So um, no, certainly applicable to organizations of, of all sizes, commercial deals of all sizes, partners of all sizes. Fantastic. Thanks, Ben. I think we may have to get you back for the next MPW web series at the end of the month because I'm posing the question as as an industry, we tend to focus really hard on participants. And I'm wondering if we're missing an opportunity by not focusing enough on fans and supporters and spectators. So uh, maybe we can have that conversation later. But time to let you get on with your day in New York. Thank you for making the early start. Thanks for the great insights and uh, look forward to speaking again soon. Thank you, everyone. Appreciate you tuning in. Thanks. Hi, Ben. Thank you. And, uh, and next up, we, we welcome uh, Professor Jonas Larsen, who's the Professor of Mobility and Urban Studies at Roskilde University. Uh, Roskilde is near Copenhagen in Denmark. Um, he is going to talk about uh, an amazing book that he's written, uh, and it's t titled Urban Marathons, Rhythms, Places and Mobilities. He's going to give us a short presentation, and then he's going to stay on to join us on the panel that follows. Welcome, Jonas. Great to see you. Thanks a lot for inviting me to this um, super exciting event. I'm, um, I'm really excited about being here today and uh, I look forward to um, the conversations and, um, and also to talk about my, my book. Um, but um, my name is um, Jonas Larsen and uh, I'm a professor at a university in, uh, in Denmark. Um, I have for, uh, for a long time been um, uh, studying and writing about um, cities and mobilities uh, in, in relation to cycling and, um, and, and walking. But more recently, I've been interested in running, in particular kind of everyday running and how everyday running take place uh, and also um, the significance of, um, of like running events like marathons. Uh, and this is in part because... Um, uh, especially the marathon has been somewhat uh, kind of neglected by social scientists, but I think they're super exciting events that we can learn a lot from. Um, and this is where my, my new book is, is coming into the picture. It was um, it came out um, the end of last year. And um, it's called Urban Marathons, Rhythms and Places and Mobilities. Uh, why it is... It, it's an academic book that is written for a social scientist um, audience. It's also, uh, uh, hopefully, it will also appeal to uh, the general reader. Um, I've tried to, to, to write it in a kind of accessible, lively and engaging kind of prose. Um, and really what the book is trying to get at is kind of offering a kind of a tangible sense of what it feels like to run a marathon. Um, so the book um, explores um, marathon running from a kind of every uh, from a bodily perspective or as a bodily practice, and as really kind of trying to get at what does it feel to run a marathon and how do we experience places, how do we experience cities, um, so that kind of sensations. 
And then I also, and that's the kind of geography in me, I'm interested in kind of running as a kind of um, spatial uh, practice, you know, how do we experience and kind of do places? What does it mean to run in different places? Um, and the book is really both looking into marathon running as a form of training and participating in events, because as you know, like um, to partake in, in a marathon, you need to, to, to do a lot, of, a lot of training and that will take place in kind of localized, you know, everyday geographies, you know, where you live. And some of these events, uh, if you participate, them will um, be in exciting places elsewhere. I guess another key kind of um, uh, a key feature of the book is that it's trying to give a kind of upbeat or sympathetic account of how marathon text plays and the kind of sensation and rhythms they invoke. So sometimes social scientists tend to be quite critical about what they are studying, but this book is, is, is slightly different. It's a very kind of positive kind of uh, exploration of you know, why people run marathon and, and what it feels like. So the focus on how marathon courses are designed, but more on how different runners are inspiring them. But also what marathons are kind of doing to the cities, how they're transforming cities, you know, on this day from Valencia Marathon, where I did my, my research. Um, I've also done research in other places, but it's like the significance of now the streets not being occupied by cars, but by a sea of runners. Um, the book is, is kind of qualitative in, in nature. That means, you know, I'm not really interested in numbers. Uh, so I've been interviewing uh, runners. I've been, you know, participating in marathons. I've been observing runners and, 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 and at uh, six different marathons. So it's about kind of getting the, the excitement of running uh, marathons. And I guess the key, uh, the, the, the starting point here in the book is this idea that running is a kind of unique urban experience, that running provides a kind of unique form of movement and kind of uh, new understandings and sensory experiences of streets and cities to kind of give them a special kind of relationship to the surfaces, topographies, traffic rules and weather conditions and type of atmospheres and sites. And really the book tries to kind of argue that marathon running provides distinctive ways of using being in and comparing cities during training and events. So in a sense that, you know, when we are running, we are also getting to know different places. And I think there's a, it's a kind of interesting um, um, uh, contrast here between like being an everyday runner, you know, training for marathons and, and then running marathons that I would like to explore today. Because very often urban runners kind of inhabit a kind of urban infrastructure that is not designed or re regulated to suit their needs of rhythms. They're often like, you know, competing with walkers for, for space on pavements and paths in, um, in parks and you know interrupted by um stoplights and so on and so forth and really um this is the kind of the exception so um you know there are it's generally the rule that there is very little if any kind of uh, specific infrastructure for running in in cities um I'm, I'm talking from copenhagen which is 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 known as a very kind of pro cycling city um, lots of investment in bike lanes, but uh, a running infrastructure is is uh, is kind of missing or is not on the agenda, and that's a theme I will come back to. And I also think that background is is really important to understand because this is what marathons are kind of they're kind of re reversing the order of things. Um, I'm arguing that marathons are kind of unique, fascinating, and transformative places. They kind of reverse the order of, of things. On this day only, you know, runners are kings and queens on the street. You know, the streets belong to them. Tens of thousands of people are coming out, you know, to cheer upon them. There's no stoplights. There's the whole kind of excitement of, of being on, on streets and running in, in really exciting places. Um, 
And allow me to be a little bit kind of academic here, but um, I'm, I'm trying to argue in the book that, you know, marathons um, are, are, are very similar and different at the same time, if we're looking at it from a kind of experience perspective. And I'm kind of trying to develop the, the concept of course places to highlight the fact that marathons are simultaneously provide kind of fast generic route, but also kind of distinctive, exciting places. It matters, you know, where they're taking place. So they're kind of similar as courses, you know, um, standardized, you know, international regulations, you know, seamless fast movement on smooth asphalt, broad streets, few corners, you know, trying to create courses that are fast, you know, they're central to like PR attempts and achievement running. The goal and start area more or less look the same. So the same kind of generic element. But I also think, and this is crucial, there are also different places. So place is the kind of concept of place that highlights place-specific uh, atmospheres, experiences, you know, sightseeing and features such as sites and neighborhoods, you know, the significance of like seeing different places when you are running. And this is very central to what I call experience running. So when I was interviewing um, uh, my interview is, you know, many were saying that marathons, you know, we do marathons to experience exciting places around the world. We enjoy um, watching places as we run, if we're not out of breath or too tired um, and so on and so forth. So the whole significance of um, designing uh, scenic routes. Um, so that was a kind of a key, key thing. And one thing that uh, was also, there's a whole chapter about it in the book is, is the um, significance of what I call kind of atmospheric sensations. And this idea that, you know, atmospheres, that, you know, that this marathon that you're participating in is a kind of vibrant, lively, engaging thing. And, and that is partly um, something that is, you know, uh, organized and this uh, states by organizers, but is also kind of co-produced, you know, massively dependent upon tens of thousands of people coming to the street, you know, cheering, screaming their lungs out, you know, playing music, shooting fireworks, you know, making signs and streets and stuff like that. So um, this is from um, Copenhagen, by the way. Um, and here you can see I also did some research in, in, in Kyoto. But for almost all my interviews, it's, it's, it's absolutely vital that the race call be not only fast, but also kind of atmospheric, full of vibrant life, you know, animating people. Come on, you can do it in certain beats, music, and interesting sights. And what is really, I guess, striking was that when you were talking with people was that this is not only something that is, you know, um, you know, makes them run better, but it was also something that had really kind of emotional or effective, like um, it touched them really deeply. And this is just, um, this is also to get a glimpse of what the book is kind of, what it's, it's about is, um, this is an interview. So I interviewed uh, Richard and Ray, it's not the real names, um, at the, um, the Berlin Marathon. And they talked about uh, London Marathon. And we, we got to talk about the atmosphere, the really long fall and atmosphere that will lift them and touch them. And I just quote uh, Richard, when we got to 15, 16 miles, he's talking about London, the crowd, the cheering, the tring, I don't know what it was, but all of a sudden, I felt like I was going to cry. All of a sudden, tears were coming down my face while I'm running, while I'm, I'm running. I don't know what it was. I was thinking to myself, put yourself together. It lasted three to four minutes. I never had anything like that before, never. Um, and I think that's a kind of good kind of example of, you know, what atmospheres are doing. So I guess these kind of atmosphere matter. They matter a lot. This is what makes marathons like extraordinary. So if marathons ever stop stating exciting uh, atmospheric places and only provide, you know, fast courses, instead they will die out immediately, unable to kind of attract um, um, new runners or what I hear called practitioners. So atmospheres are crucial. Um, another kind of key concept in the book that's kind of tying the whole thing together. And I guess, I guess that's my attempt to try to understand or describe or explain what marathon is about, is this kind of what I call a drama of rhythms. Um, and, and, and I guess this kind of picture is kind of illustrating what I'm trying to get at. 
that um, marathons are kind of painstakingly planned to be kind of predictable ordered events. Kind of that's what you know race organizers doing. You know everything should be in plan. You know the route should be fast and so on and so forth. It's also something we as runners are achieving through at training. You know following programs. You know trying to run in a specific pace and stuff like that. And sometimes we do succeed, but very often we do not succeed or not as much as we expected. So sometimes things go wrong, anticipated rhythms uh, become something else. And as organizers, you know how marathons can be not ruined by, by trouble, by inclement weather, terror attacks, epidemics, courses be can become slow, marathons are canceled. What I'm really kind of getting at with the book is how, um, you know, as a, as a marathon runner, uh, how things, you know, might go, might go wrong or what we expected that the kind of rhythm or the pace we anticipated are coming to an halt. And then on the day, runners might realize that the bodies are kind of irrational, embodied, prone to cramps, heat stroke, and shoe in Use blisters, not the kind of well-oiled, carefully engineered machines that our training got us to believe that we were. And as this poor man here in the picture, they can experience pains while others we spy on a road to a new record. Um, and I guess, you know, I kind of end my book on, on, on this note. Um, and I guess that's part of the fascination that are driving people to come back to marathons um, year after year, uh, that marathons attract so many practitioners or, or runners because they're kind of rational and irrational at the same time. Predictable, yet always producing surprises. Why did I fail? Next year, things will be different. And I'm now coming to my, my, my last slide. I'm trying to kind of open up the discussions a little bit and, and hopefully... Um, for the, the forthcoming um, 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 the panel discussion. And I think what is really interesting, um, departing a little bit from my book, um, I'm, I'm spending a lot of time around urban planners and designers. Um, and I think marathons really sits well with some of the kind of key discussions within kind of urban planning and design. That could be ideas around that, you know, long-standing discussion around cities as kind of tourism places that events can create, uh, could create many tourists and, and so on and so forth. But maybe more substantially is the kind of the new kind of uh, focus on shifting attention away from cities as places or streets as um, streets for cars and more emphasis on kind of car-free urban life around many cities around the world. Um, the same kind of cities that are also hosting marathons, by the way. So um, kind of slogans around streets for people, not cars. Uh, that is a lot of focus these days on what is called walkability. Again, the emphasis is on shifting people away from cars to more walking. And the way in which to do that is kind of designing uh, walking friendly cities and environments that are safe, inclusive, and so on and so forth. And of course, there's also lots of um, emphasis on discussions around active mobility and health for cities, for example, cycling, building bike lanes and pavements and stuff. But what I'm finding really interesting or, or sad in some ways is that, you know, uh, there's very little talk about runnability. I'm really looking forward to hear about um, Sarah and Charlie's um, research um, in a little while, but there's very little talk about runnability as a concept. And I guess it's still the case that running events are often kind of still kind of seen as out of place in the way of cars and they have to take place on a Sunday where there are a few cars in the first place. And there's this idea that I think that running is still kind of mar marginalized. It's not high on the agenda in uh, municipality planning. And I think that's partly um, the reason for that is partly this kind of uh, um, prevailing idea that running can take place everywhere and anywhere, um, and that still prevails. But what I think marathons kind of demonstrate, and I think that would be my, my ending point, is that marathons demonstrate that running infrastructures matters and that people enjoy running 
when the infrastructure is in place. And um, allow me to do some shameless self-promotion. So if you're interested, um, my book is on, on sale. Uh, so uh, you can get it through uh, Routeless pretty cheap if you're interested. And uh, I look forward to the discussion and, and feel free to, to contact me if you have questions or, I don't know, collaboration in the future and, and stuff. Um, so um, I'm excited about being here today. So thank you for listening. Okay. Thank you so much, Janus. And uh, great uh, to get those insights. And, and certainly we're going to touch on some of them uh, during the course of uh, the, the panel that uh, we're going to start introducing our other panelists for. Uh, thanks again. Um, so to discuss what makes a running city over the next 45 minutes or so, uh, Delighted to welcome back, of course, Prof. Jonas Larsen. Uh, joining us will also be Dr. Sarah McBride-Stewart, Reader in Health, Medicine and Society, the School of Social Sciences at Cardiff University. Uh, hello there, Sarah. Nice to see you again. Hello. Welcome. Thank you for inviting us. Wonderful. And uh, your colleague, Dr. Charlotte Brookfield, Senior Lecturer in Social Sciences, School of Social Sciences, Cardiff University. Also, obviously, joining us from a very sunny Cardiff. Nice to see you again, Charlotte. Hi, lovely to see everybody. Thank you. Uh, joining us all the way from New York, Ted Metellus, Vice President, New York Roadrunners and Race Director of the TCS New York Marathon, well known to many of the people on this call. Hello, Ted. Nice to see you. Hello, everyone. Hey, Chris, thank you so much for having me. Wonderful. Appreciate you making the time and an early start over there. Um, and, and a man who's been very busy, just flowing in from London, Mr. Lim Tech Yin, the CEO of Sports Singapore. Thank you so much, Tech Yin. Great to see you again. Thanks for joining us. Yeah, hello, everybody. And thanks, Chris, for having me on this panel. Wonderful. Really looking forward to this conversation. Ted, why don't we, we start with you? I think, you know, New York is unquestionably recognized as as a running city uh, obviously the new york marathon as 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 a real you know pinnacle of that but there's so much more that underpins that i'd love to get your insights over a couple of minutes of 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 why that tag and some of the key elements of of why new york is recognized as a running city please yeah i mean the the short answer is just um you know the years that this event's happened and to the scale that it's happened um, first marathon was in 1970 uh, in Central Park, which is a, a, a main park in New York City in Manhattan, uh, where participants in multiple loops there. And in 1976, uh, there was a plan to take this event and run it through all five boroughs. So uh, New York City is comprised of five boroughs, Manhattan, Bronx, Brooklyn, Queens, Staten Island. Um, so those are towns or little regions, if you may say, depending on where you are around the world. And this goal in this plan was to take, uh, it was to celebrate um, the centennial celebration in 1776 with America getting its independence. Let's do this big event. Let's have this be a part of the city's revitalization uh, in 1976. And a group of runners start in Staten Island, navigated through all five boroughs and finished in New York. Uh, as many of us have known, the attempt was like, oh, we'll do this once, once in to, to celebrate this and here we are, we've celebrated the 50th anniversary of the event. Um, you know, in 2026, we'll be celebrating the 50th anniversary of the five boroughs. Uh, but one of the things, or many of the things that, that Jonas mentioned apply in what you see in New York. Um, there's a community feel to it. There's an engagement there. There's tremendous legacy that's there. Um, the legacy is not exclusive to just the participants, but the communities at large that have been a part of this. Um, the race has navigated through 26.2 miles of New York City for 50 years, and there are multiple generations of families that have been there that have either volunteered, participated, ran, or spectated. Um, it is hard pressed to not know someone that has been involved in the marathon at some capacity. So that has been part of uh, what is like the New York City experience. The event has obviously had a global impact because when you're talking about a major metropolitan city like New York, people have come here. Uh, I've traveled the world, I've traveled places. People ask you where I'm from. Uh, I'll say New York City before I say America. And they're like, oh, New York, I love New York. So. There's a connection that's there uh, when you think about other large scale um, urban markets throughout the world. Um, from New York, other large scale events started to happen, whether it was in Chicago or London or Berlin, Tokyo, all taking tips and learning from one another about the art of producing um, a large scale urban event. But at its core, 
and at the core of what we all do in this industry, one, first and foremost, is that we produce a logistically sound, operationally sound and safe event. That's always been the base of what we've done. And we've watched this transition from a road race to an event experience. Um, so that way there's the broadcasting component, there's the television component that's tied to that. Um, again, reconnecting with brands and partnership. Um, someone put in the chat the value of clubs and crews that continues to cultivate the community that is the running event. And that's been a huge part of what the success is with New York and the New York City Marathon. Thanks, Ted. And, and, and so that, that little event all those years ago that proved the catalyst to this amazing running city. And, and, and I'd like to use that as a segue to come to you, if I may, please, Tekian, because I think a, a similar story, albeit, um, you know, a few decades behind in Singapore, the, the Standard Chartered Singapore Marathon as this catalyst, which I think I'm right in saying started with 3,000 participants, grew at its peak to 60,000 now, you know, hopefully post-pandemic to be close back to the 2019 levels of 50,000. But this catalyst for building Singapore into a running city and many more elements wrapped around that. Would you like to pick up on that story a little bit from a Singapore perspective, please? Well, thank you very much, Chris. And, and you have been intimately involved with the Singapore Marathon over the years, and you've understood that, you know, the, the enthusiasm to be able to run on, uh, on our, our major roads past, uh, you know, the grand sites of Singapore has always been a grand attraction uh, for runners when the marathon is held at the end of the year. And I think it's been a very important sort of event to be able to stage as a, a celebration event at the end of the year, where it's typically held in December. And pre-pandemic, we were very happy that there were easily about 100 running events in the year being staged in Singapore. So something happening every weekend and having this marquee marathon event of the year certainly added to that atmosphere for the running city. But I think what's also important is that as this event grew from, you know, from 3,000 runners up to 60 and then back down to 50, was the notion that we had to improve the infrastructure uh, to make this event more viable, more enjoyable. And that's something that we've been focusing on uh, as we continue to promote running as a core sport in Singapore. So, you know, I, I like what Dr. Larson said earlier on. Uh, that, you know, if, when you look at urban environments and if you want to encourage running, uh, you have to think about the infrastructure and the atmosphere. And that's something that we paid attention to and I would say has been an important part of the growth of this event. Um, you know, when, when you were running it, uh, you started running at the, you know, at the Orchard Road, the shopping belt of Singapore where the Christmas light up just gets everybody excited to be there on the ground. Thanks, Tekian. And we'll come on to some of the other ancillaries a little bit more in the conversation in terms about the infrastructure. That one great slide that uh, Professor Larson put up with the, uh, you know, the, the, the running paths and the cycling paths side by side. Singapore has this amazing network of park connectors, but we'll, we'll come back and touch on that. And I think that contributes to runnability. And, and, and let's use that as a segue. Sarah's nodding there about the, the research and maybe just give a little bit of a touch on the research that you've done around Cardiff uh, that you and Charlotte worked on and maybe just have a conversation with maybe you starting off, Sarah, and then Charlotte giving some insights in, in terms of, you know, maybe let the audience know a little bit about that research and some of those key findings around runnability that you discovered. Yeah, thank you for that. Well, actually, you know, I had been researching trail running until the point that um, Cardiff Half Marathon approached us through the partnership with Cardiff University to, to look at, it came to us with a question, which was why do women who uh, they, they had more women than men enroll and register for the for the event, but they had more women drop out. So actually at the start line, there were more men. And we wanted to know what was happening in that training kind of period and what was happening in, in the kinds of, um, as, as I think Jonas picked up, the, what was happening to how people were using the city to run and to train. And we found that quite a lot of the, we, we asked women about some of the barriers and we know a lot about why women do run. We know a lot about why people run. We know people talk about mental health. We know they talk about physical health. We know they talk about the social aspects. We know that the social clubs that um, Ben was, Bob was talking about, sorry, Ben was talking about really work. But we actually found that most of the barriers were structural, that actually it was a lot about the runnability of the city. 
So actually a lot of the, the challenges that people face and, and particularly women, we focus a lot on women, potentially because they're, they're an under-researched group actually. So when we look at running, a lot of our work's been done with, a lot of work's been done with elite athletes, a lot of it's been done with kind of fun runners or entry runners, but we were really interested and I'm really interested in the kind of the everyday kind of mundane experiences of, of kind of getting out there, putting your, um, tying your laces up and getting out from your front door and what happens. And so women talked a lot about the kind of the conditions of the pavements. They talked a lot about the kind of lighting. They talked a lot about, and particularly when they're training, not just for 5K, but when they're training for a marathon or a half marathon, they're doing exactly what Ted said. They're running through more than one district, more than one borough. And so actually they're experiencing the city almost like an eco-tourist. And so they're, they're, they're experiencing the city like a tourist and they're having to find ways to run and they're, they're navigating the city. So quite a lot of the barriers they told us about were, were just those, how they had to cross streets, how they had to cross um, busy traffic, how they had to, they often wanted to run to parks. Green spaces are incredibly valued in our cities. Um, and so are green corridors if you have them, but not every community has access to that. As we become more urbanized, really, and I'm really interested in the environmental aspects, we have less green space. And we have many areas that make cities feel particularly for women unsafe so that was kind of one of the the other one of the the key areas but one of the other things that we also talked to women about was you know what were some of the other barriers and actually because running fits into leisure one of the biggest problems for women was that when work became more challenging uh when childcare became more challenging but particularly work that it was women's leisure time that, that got lost. And we found that increasingly with the pandemic. We found that people who are more precarious in their work lives, people who couldn't stop work uh, under the pandemic, so delivery drivers, healthcare workers, it was their leisure time, their running time that got affected. So actually, and they were the ones that needed to be able to get out of their front door to run well. So we found, and I'll pass it over to Charlotte, but those were kind of some of the main areas and, and thinking about how runnable a city is, thinking about the rhythms of work and life, how your, how your work life, how your leisure life fits into the rhythms of a city, but also how those structural barriers of a city actually make it difficult or difficult for some groups to move around um, relative, more than others, actually. Thanks, Charlotte. All right. Charlotte, yes. over to you. Yeah, I was just going to add to what, what Sarah said is really we were focusing on what were those barriers to inclusion and accessibility for women to run and to make sure that the diverse communities of women across Cardiff felt able to train for these longer distance events. And, and Sarah talked about how perhaps um, certain areas have been under research, including women's participation, but I think also it was the longer distance that, that really got us interested in being involved with this, this project with the Cardiff Half Marathon. Um, the other thing kind of just to talk a little bit more about the research and, and what we did is actually we, we designed a survey to get at a lot of these issues um, and that was distributed to all the women that had uh, registered for the event. So we've got a, a big wealth of data there on the women that registered, including actually some women who um, either had to um, previously hadn't been unable to get to the start line of a race they talked about that or were actually even at that point saying that they weren't going to be able to make it to the start point of Cardiff half marathon with with Cardiff University so so that was really interesting data for us to understand some of the, those barriers that women do face in in both their training and being able to attend some of these events and then following on from that we had the qualitative element of the research which I'm sure Sarah will talk a little bit more detail later on about but that was where we managed to get some of these more in-depth discussions with women that belong to running groups or social groups um, to find out exactly what it was that, that they were facing and, and we focused there on, on four different areas in Cardiff and, and they were areas that were sort of below the UK average for household income so they are the ones that perhaps are more uh, marginalized perhaps more likely to be in these precarious roles as Sarah's already mentioned so so really thinking about how we can facilitate and enable them to get get involved with running thanks Charlotte and and, and I'd love to take that as a bit of a cue um, as maybe a, a bit of a general conversation for, for for the next little while around you know it's I guess it's easy for us to focus on 
a New York marathon uh, with, with the facilities and, and a big marathon and a Singapore marathon with government support. Um, but maybe starting with you, Jonas, and, and coming back through, through Ted and, and, and maybe Tech Yin, and again, again, back to the Cardiff study, um, Norrie Williamson put a, a great comment in, in, the, in the chat saying, you know, it's easy to focus on these big cities, but it's so different in every country around the world, him based in South Africa and Africa, as these countries are, are emerging. I'd, I'd love because we've got people from clearly all over the world here and we've got some people from the big developed cities that have these legacies of, you know, 50 years and the like. But, you know, what are some of the insights maybe for for smaller cities that are emerging, not even necessarily small in terms of their population? But Jonas, what might you have seen? And you, you spoke about, you know, running being marginalized. Ted, I posed the question to you in the preparation of, you know, New York runs through all of the five boroughs. It ends in this, you know, this blessing of Central Park, which many cities don't have. What have you maybe done to take that? And I know there's lots that you've done to take it out to some of the other boroughs on an ongoing basis and, and, and tech in around the heartlands of Singapore, how you've brought them into it. So why don't we start with you on that, Jonas, and then bring it down to, to Ted and then come around to tech in and, and, and maybe bring that back and see how it relates to some of the fi other findings of the study, if that's okay with everyone. You're muted there, Jonas. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a really interesting question. Also, quite difficult, I guess. But I mean, I think um, I think what is key here is like when I'm saying that running is marginalised is I think first of all, and I think that is really uh, nicely tying into um, the, the Cardiff study is kind of uh, um, appreciating and understanding that you know that, that running cannot take place everywhere, and that some environments are better uh, for running than others. And I think um, maybe to make a parallel to, to cycling, a key finding across you know the literature on cycling is that if you wanna if you want to have people cycle, it's not just a question about telling them it's, it's good for you to cycle, it's good for the environment, it's good for for your health. You actually need to to build an appropriate infrastructure, and that infrastructure can be like bike lanes, it can be you know, lightning and all that. Um, that is one element. So I think like really campaign for, um, for infrastructure. And I guess it's also, what is also crucial is like when something is marginalized, it's not about, you know, it's not a, about making a war against car drivers or anything like that. It's about normalizing running, saying that is something that is, 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 is possible for um, a great uh, majority of people. And I think this is what makes marathons so interesting, you know, because I've looked into the history of marathons. It used to be like this event for like really skinny, fast men, you know, uh, fiercely competing to now becoming mass events. And I think, um, I think there's a lot to learn here about embracing wider populations, but also understanding that infrastructure matters. So embracing wider populations, infrastructure is important. Can yeah. we can we bring that to you, Ted? And in, in terms of you know how how, how New Yorkers and New York Roadrunners, you know, you have maybe just tell the people that, that don't know how many events you have a year, and, and and maybe a bit of a sense of how those spread through the city and and draw people in, so to speak. Absolutely, Chris. Um, uh, we produce in New York Roadrunners approximately forty-two events, um, adult events, and then another thirty youth events throughout the New York area. Um, that's not to tack on uh, open run, uh, which is uh, free park runs that we have throughout the tri-state area. Um, those are usually 5K distances where people can come out into the communities and it all uh, engages health and wellness. So as Sarah mentioned before, and I fully agree with you, and it was very apparent over the last couple of years, the physical benefits, the, the I'm sorry, the mental and emotional benefits to physical activity. And... Um, being outside and moving your body uh, helped tremendously on an emotional level. So we do a, a, a you know a calendar's worth of events, um, you know everything from a one mile distance to twenty six point two miles throughout the tri state area. Um, to the point about being able to produce an event in a different market outside of a large market, I've been blessed in my twenty five years to have produced events in very very small towns. Um, and where the event was as big, if not bigger than the people that the, the town itself, as far as its population. 
Um, and there, those events have a level of character to it that's tremendous. Um, one in the States uh, is Grandma's Marathon, Grandma's Half Marathon uh, in Duluth, Minnesota. So look it up. Uh, amazing event, very uh, popular, but it's a you know, small town race and it draws and engages people from literally all over the country, let alone all over the world because of the the charm of that market in that area. Um, there are always gonna be key drivers to success, whether it's producing an event in Brooklyn, Staten Island, the Bronx, uh, Manhattan. We now are producing an event across the river in Jersey, in Jersey City, um, where you want to make sure that infrastructure is in place, people can get there with relative ease, the roads are laid out properly, uh, minimizing as much impact as possible to the community at large. Um, embracing and engaging what the event is and amplifying what that is so that the community can be involved and engage. Those are key components that apply everywhere to the events. Um, but what, what you ultimately want to do and what you saw with, uh, as a story I told you about the uh, 1970 marathon, then going to the 76 marathon to where we are right mm -hmm. now is as the popularity, the engagement um, and the sport grew, um, the ability to grow that event group. So you, we could have done multiple loops inside of mm -hmm. Central Park, which is a six mile loop. But then we mm -hmm. say, hey, listen, let's expand this, grow this and get this to larger places because the demand and interest is there. Mm. Thanks, Ted. Some great insights there. Take in, let, let, let's come to you. So, you know, Sing Singapore, I guess, unique in some ways with, uh, you know, great government collaboration, huge master plan, um, you know, amazing park connectors. Maybe just share for the uninitiated your incredible network of park connectors, how that feeds in, you know, the, the, the community clubs around Singapore um, that are managed by Sports SG and how that's kind of contributed to the, the, the runnability and the running city. Well, thank you very much, Chris. You know, as a, as a relatively young uh, and small island city state, I think we've been blessed with uh, a very strong sensibility of the need to be strong in master planning. And I think the government has 10 year to 30 year master plans when we think about infrastructure. A key aspect uh, that has featured in our master planning, especially when the population grows and creates uh, sort of this amenities when people live in high density areas is the need to think about the concept of livability. Mm. You have an overarching livability framework, then you try to integrate the ideas for housing for which 80% of the population lives in government driven uh, public housing projects. Uh, so housing that's connected to the green lung of Singapore mm. as, a, as a city in a garden and how then active and sporting spaces integrate with that. And I would say that uh, we are very fortunate that the investment to grow park connectors in Singapore has now given us a 300 kilometer stretch mm. of uh, park connectors today that join up all our parks. Uh, this is augmented by a coast to coast trail that is now already 35 kilometers long and will continue to grow as well as a round island route uh, that takes us at about 150 kilometers. Now, all of these uh, spaces, all these connectors then connect our green spaces. They land at various locations, including our sports centers and housing development projects. And um, we have a multi-agency group that sits regularly together to see how we can improve because master planning is one thing, uh, but implementation is entirely mm -hmm. another matter. And as you begin to deal with legacy infrastructure, you have to constantly look at how you can improve connection. So sometimes when a connector crosses a, a road or has to cross a waterway, uh, we've looked at how we can improve that particular crossing by either creating a bridge across and you have to, to debate, can we have a ramp or is it going to be a staircase? And of course, we prefer a ramp, but then the gradient all starts to come in. But I think there's a high level of attention that's placed on that. And this has led tremendously to the growth of running in Singapore. But an important point also, and I say this again when it comes to people living in a dense environment, is how we develop social norms and protocols on how we share these amazing spaces. So between runners, cyclists, families taking walks, uh, rollerbladers, um, you know, we have opted not to demarcate lanes. Uh, in most of our park connectors, we just make sure we put a lot of shine, signs out there to say uh, this is to be shared and we leave it to the people to sort it out. 
and that's still a work in progress. And I think, uh, yeah, it's an exciting thing to be able to come and enjoy these. Mm. Thank you, Tech Yen. Uh, yeah, anyone who has the chance to, to go and see those is incredible. And to give you maybe some context for someone who, who hasn't been to Singapore, when, when I lived there, I lived there for 12 years. I, I used to do a lot of, of cycling. The old knees had, had gone a little bit from my running years. And, you know, the, the, the long cycle would be 90 kilometers around in a, in a straightforward route. And if you look at those distances that Tech Yen has, has shared in terms of 200 of park connectors and 35 kilometers of an amazing trail, which is a reclaimed railway line that used to run to Malaysia, it gives you a real sense of how the government's come together and, and, and really made that happen. Let's come back to, to the, the team in Cardiff and, 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 and get your kind of sense. And I see it, saw quite a lot, lot of nodding there while the other panelists were speaking. What, what are you thinking, Sarah, in relation to that and, and, and also Charlotte? I think where we were, we, where we were thinking was, um, and, I, and I just have to, you know, teching, I think, you know, Singapore is really a kind of an ideal model. You've, you've really worked, really worked at a high level across all kind of, urban infrastructure, city planners. I mean, I think this is really critical to um, working, you know, the, the opportunities for mass participation events to really talk to urban city planners about mm. making runnable sustainable. When we ask people about how, how it is sustainable, you know, how to make it sustainable, these are the, the really key elements in, in linking up um, areas. I mean, but it did raise a question for us in Cardiff. We do have an 88 kilometer trail, uh, off-road trail that takes you from the heart of Cardiff or from the sea right up to, um, to the mountains, to, um, to one of our first national parks. But we recognize that that wasn't accessible for everyone. And, and really what we were pushing people to remind uh, some of the people that we were working with was that it's easy to get in some city spaces, imagine that you have a lot of green space. But when you actually talk to people who are not as quite co-located to that green space, that's where the real barriers um, lie. And, and those are the people that actually really are wanting the access and the use of green space. So we, we really encourage, you know, as much as working with city planners, as much as working with um, health, uh, health professionals, as, as much as working with local government and, and central government in, in really thinking about planning infrastructure to make cities runnable and, as Tech Yang has said, livable. And I think that's absolutely um, entirely where we were thinking in a small city that has a reputation for being green, um, but actually uh, is also uh, has a lot of inequality across it. Um, and we were just really wanting to, to remind and, and keep on the agenda that kind of um, social justice framework for thinking about running and, and how people run on an everyday basis. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, Charlotte? Yeah, just, just a couple of things to build on from Sarah. I was looking at my notes when, when she was speaking there and, and actually it was almost half of our participants reported the poor conditions of pavements, uh, lack of lighting, trees or plants blocking the pavements as barriers to their running. Um, and, and particularly in terms of the lighting, those four areas that, that we focused on seem to be a real issue. Um, and in one area in particular, over half of women reported that as, as a problem. And that then fed into issues around safety as well. Um, and women talking about techniques that they use to make themselves feel a little bit safer when they were running. So avoiding particular times of day or, or running in, in larger groups as well. Um, one of our areas as well that we looked at, um, I was thinking about it there when Sarah was speaking, um, people saying that the pavements were often ran out as well, which was a, a challenge for them. Um, and, and again, going back to these green spaces, although there were calls for women to be able to get to those spaces to be able to run, actually, if those areas were, were locked up over, it, or you know, if they were dark at night or there weren't obvious other people in those areas, did women necessarily feel safe training in those, those green spaces even? Um, so actually calls for those spaces to be better lit as well and have safety precautions in place. So thank you for those insights. I'd, I'd love to kind of m try and shift the lens again a little bit back to less developed. Um, where, where, what, what are some of the, the tips that we can give for um, 
you know, cities that are emerging, countries that are emerging. If you go into, you know, Asia, running is is exploding here. But you know, some some Asian cities, you, you know, you you're walking down a, a pavement and there's you know no manhole covers and and big gaps that you need to to walk through. And and and, and I guess trying to get that catalyst of you know advice, Jonas, maybe what you've seen in terms of your research. Some cities embrace it. Other cities don't embrace it. Governments don't embrace it. Is there a reason for that? Is is it that, you know, in a third world country, the governments are so focused on other things that are more important, whilst everyone on this call is saying clearly running is important because it's physical health and it's mental health. But if you're a government with a limited budget sitting in a in a third world country um, and, and, and you want to take those first steps, what what are some of those things? Is it, is it government? Is it corporate led? And I'd like to speak about partners because I think there's, you know, some some great partners on this panel. You know, Singapore Marathon may not have started. I'm sure the government would have supported it. But Standard Chartered Bank was a huge support of that and still is. TCS in New York, a, a really valuable corporate partner. How important is that? Is it, is it government's responsibility or is it a partnership? How, how does our ecosystem as we move forward make cities more runnable? How do we help to create running cities without saying it's not our fault, it's the government's responsibility? We can't stage our races because the roads aren't good enough and the roads won't be closed and we have problems with permits. But is, is, is it, you know, what, what is that ecosystem and who needs to be involved to help create that catalyst? Any senses there from, from you? Jonas? Um, yeah, I think I think from, from a starting point, of course, is there is that, that kind of challenge that running is seen as a kind of leisure. And of course, that is something that is is, is not high on the agenda if there are more kind of um, uh, pressing needs. Um, I don't think anything should be also if you're looking into the history of running, I also think it's something that is coming very much come from civil society, but not like if you're looking at the whole kind of, for example, the jogging movement in the US. So, so I also think it's also about encouraging kind of running communities around the world. Um, it's about kind of um, kind of supporting them because like, I don't think we can only rely on, on the government of, 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 of putting in the infrastructure. But there's also something again, if you're looking into both the history of running, but also cycling, there's something about a critical mass. So once you start recognizing cyclists on the road once you start recognizing runners uh, in parks and, and on pavements then their particular needs become more legitimate so i think it's very much about um all sorts of kind of um support but also really taking into account the kind of the, the civil society and also um, i think running is interesting uh, because you have like running communities all over the world that might not be you know traditional kind of sport associations um so i think parts of it will come from uh, from bottom up and i think maybe the big races can can probably support some of these kind of um, um kind of uh, yeah associations that are coming more kind of informally from, from uh, above and uh, below sorry thank you jonas maybe come back to you ted any in any thoughts there any comments experiences i mean lo love to hear some of um you know the TCS engagement as part of that partnership. And, 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 you know, I think so often it's, you know, we've spoken and addressed that infrastructure is, is clearly in many ways a part of it. And, and Norrie said, you know, you could hard, his comment is <clears throat> you can hardly find a more normalized acceptance of running than Africa, providing the fastest runners in the world. What's yeah. missing is advice on how to get the interaction with authorities, he feels. Um, but so so you know there's there's this interaction with authorities but there's also this growing of this community which has obviously yeah. happened in new york in, in in huge levels to bring us to this critical mass uh, and, and and quite often it's it's initiatives of partners in collaboration with others that helps to build that critical mass you know one of the amazing programs we had michelle taylor the global head of uh, of sponsorship for tcs do an amazing presentation at mpw conference in singapore in i think it was 2018 and she shared the initiative there that's been done with the teachers and maybe you can you can share on that and so you know you have these teachers without telling the story for you these teachers that that get to participate in the new york marathon and they bring the kids along with them and you create this ripple L love to hear a little bit more about that and maybe some of the other initiatives that you partner with tcs with to to highlight that you know this difference that government has a role to play but we as an industry and other partners have a key role to play 
mean, Chris, you hit it on the head there. I think that there's a tremendous opportunity of collaboration. Um, uh, I think Jonas and Sarah and Charlotte also mentioned this as well in, in, in a unique way, a demystification of running where mm. they think running is somebody else's activity in sport and not theirs. Um, mm. So to the point about partnership and an engagement there, uh, there is on the on the ground level, obviously communicating to uh, local municipalities and businesses about if there is going to be any sort of city development or work being done, uh, being mindful of the benefits of people, not just running, but walking, uh, people taking their children out for a stroll, older people that are out and about on these paths, cyclists that are on the roadways. It's not just one demographic that's going to benefit from any infrastructure that's being mm -hmm. done. It's a community at large. And that's outside of a big city or anything there. So at minimum, communicating that, communicating the benefits there will definitely amplify some movement from a local uh, uh, government and local municipality perspective. From a, from a partnership side, they then are amplifying that as well because they, whether it's with youth, uh, whether it's with teachers, uh, with uh, families that are getting out there and seeing the benefits of movement with activity, uh, partners like TCS, partners like MasterCard that are going into these neighborhoods and communities and engaging with small businesses. The small business, business benefits will come into play here too, because if there is a local shop, bar, restaurant in a community where there are uh, the roads are really nice. People can run by, talk to them, engage with them, let them know that there's going to be an event, a function, activity, a training run of some sort. Can we stop here and use your facility? Can this be our rest spot where we'll come in and have something to eat and drink? That's going to be direct economic impact that's happening in that space too, which mm -hmm. then moves the needle in engaging with local businesses in that sense. Um, there's a lot of low hanging pieces that are there that take some work, but also more importantly, take time to communicate and engage and saying, listen, I know I'm speaking on behalf of this audience, but the actions here will benefit many others across mm -hmm. the board. One other quick thing too, is if there are parks departments um, that are in play or municipality spaces that manage and maintain a uh, green space, talking and engaging with them seeing if there are dates and times that they could be very specific times that there are no vehicles in a park space so people can come out and run. Um, there had, and this has been something that's been evolving throughout the states here, but it's starting to see happen in other areas where they say on a weekend between the hours of blank and blank, there'll be no vehicles here to allow people to run and be active and, and you know train or, or gather in, in these types of activities. Communicating in that way there, where there is a compromise, in saying we want to maintain, we want to sustain, but we want to engage here as well. One other quick thing too uh, to close up here um, on the community engagement part is uh, as it relates to municipalities and businesses, there are clubs and crews that do um, on the ground work as far as maintaining their neighborhoods. So plogging, for example, um, going to a place of sustainability that I know Sarah, Sarah and Charlotte have talked about, that's action being taken place on the ground. So if a municipality in the market says, listen, we don't have the resources for a uh, park or city staff to maintain and clean these spaces afterwards, it was like, no problem. We're gonna do our part here because we use this space by organizing a 5K where the 5K is basically, we're gonna run down and clean an area up as part of us giving back to the space in the community as well. How do we continue to build upon that to help then uh, finance and work on lighting in a neighborhood, road work in a neighborhood, because we have now taken action ourselves on the ground. But turning back to the top really quickly, Chris, to your point about the partnership side, um, you know, whether it's TCS or MasterCard or any of the other partners that may be involved with your, your event, uh, your events, let them know about the route. Let them know about the areas and streets and communities that you run through, not just on race day, but where people are running and being active during their training and during their preparation as well, and how those areas and those communities can be engaged with through schools that may be there, where these teachers are there, these students are in that area, and they can come out and celebrate and support what um, the benefits of health and activity are, are being done from a partnership level, from an event level, and then from the participant in their community level as well. Thank you, Ted, and, and yeah, there was that. I can't remember when it was. I, I hosted a discussion. I think Mike Nishi was on it, and, and someone passed a comment that some of our major marathons kind of 
act like tourists where they run through a particular district once a year and that's the only time they engage with them. But there's this opportunity to be able to say, we engage with you in the planning, we understand what some of the challenges in your community are, how might we be able to support your community? And, and you know, you, you, you're, you're, you're putting together in these days of much more focus, understandably and importantly on purpose-driven engagement, this, this opportunity to be part of a community rather than just run through it and pass through it and, and, and make a much larger contribution. Tiki, let, let's come back to you to pick up a, a, on a couple of those points. And I'd like to kind of get your take on what's been said, but also the all important discussion about permits, because, you know, I, I sometimes feel that um, you know, with, with, with the network of people I engage with around the world, there's collaboration, which has always been my mantra for these things ever since I organized my first event. And then there's the kind of adversarial ones of, you know, we need our permit, you can't have your permit, put these obstacles in place. And Singapore's done a lot of work to try and centralize that permitting, make it easier, recognizing the value of it. And, and I'd love, you know, your comments on what's been said for both the others and, 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 and maybe a share of some of the things you've done with, with with permitting to make it easier and more collaborative with the community. Yeah, thank you very much, Chris. Well, you know, we've we've had a lot of engagements with uh, event promoters as well as organizers of, of uh, mass participation events. And inevitably, they will have to navigate the entire bureaucracy of different agencies from the Parks Board to the Urban Redevelopment Authority, the Land Transport Authority and ourselves, uh, just to get clearances to be able to stage such an event. Uh, what's very clear to us was that there was a fair amount of duplication and you know, um, trying to, to uh, really find the, the, the shortest way possible to get through it. And I think we took inspiration from some of the sharing of our various promoters about what they see in other cities. And we created a study around a service journey, uh, really government wanting to be able to be of service to the people, to the promoters, to the organizers. And what we have since developed is really a one-stop portal uh, for applications uh, where uh, all that duplication can be cut out. So if there's a need for a, for example, a submission of a, a, a route uh, that's being used, that is a one-time submission that all the different agencies who need it can access it accordingly. And we've sort of calculated the productivity that can be gained from this. It actually cuts it down by more than 50% of the time required for the application of these permits. Now we were just about to roll this out on a pilot uh, and then the pandemic hit us. So in the year ahead, this is something that we are really going to try very hard to resolve. Um, there is also a, a, a very clear uh, uh, approach to define a lead agency for a particular event. And, and you know, if the lead agencies like the tourism board, they will rally around to get everybody else in line in support, support of the promoter or the Sport Singapore, we will do so likewise. So we've taken the leaf out of much of the sharing and including yourself who shared to us about the Sydney Ops Group uh, that makes it so much easier to get this done. Thank you, Tekin. Some, some great and, and I'm sure valuable insights to, to many people as, as, as running comes forward. Let's, we've got about five minutes to go and, and, and I think, you know, there's, there's no doubt in my mind that health and well-being, it's been touched on um, a, a little bit here, uh, the, the value of, of running and, and mass participation generally on, on health and well-being um, as we come back to these events. Maybe just a quick wrap from everyone in terms of, you know, it, the, the, how, how do we integrate and how do we get that message through um, to partners, attracting more partners, to governments, this key role of running and running cities to be able to contribute to the health and well-being of communities. Who'd like to pick that one up as a, as a starter? And we've, we've got five minutes left, so about a, a minute each on just on your take of, you know, uh, th throw you a curly one to end it with, but, you know, how does this industry take a step forward to really contribute to the health and well-being of humanity as we come past COVID? You want me to jump in? I'll say it super fast in like 40 seconds. Uh, amplify, amplify that, you know, amplify the benefits of health and wellness, demystify what running is it, and promote movement. Um, I think uh, Sarah said something really well here. So Sarah, you've been crushing it. Uh, and, I, and we've amplified this as well. The single best way to see a market, a neighborhood, a community, a new city 
is by foot. Just getting out and walking around and seeing that. So um, if you're coming into a new place, if you're coming to a new city, if you're in your neighborhoods or your communities, if you're in your cities, get out and be there and see what's happening there and share that story, whether it's through social media or through your communities there. I think that's the best way. It's just amplify it in action. Great point. Thank you, Ted. Jonas, you got your hand yeah, up there. Yeah, I mean, oh, oh, yeah, yeah, also kind of amplifying that, you know, that uh, these kind of, um, whether it's half marathon, sin case, whatever, they're kind of, they're, they're mass events that can bring in, you know, people with different bodies, you know, um, all sorts of ages. It's very, in kind of, it potentially very inclusive events um, that can, you know, bring a sense of joy and you can kind of celebrate you know, health through that they are not kind of exclusive. It's not only for the professionals. It's like, you know, different bodies are coming together. And I think that is what potentially make, you know, these kind of events special. You know, you have some of the fastest runners or, and then you have, you know, slower runners. And, and, and that is kind of quite unique. And I think that needs to be really celebrated also when you are talking with municipalities and sponsors and stuff like that. Um, that's a key setting point, as far as I see, also in terms of health. Great point, and, and touched on in a number of your slides there as well, that atmospheric of it, that experience. I mean, the data is showing that, that runners are getting slower generally, and I don't think it's because they're getting slower. I think they're enjoying the experience more. It's the stopping for the selfies and engaging with the community, and, and, and it's not so much about the racing of, apart from a small few people at the, at the top. Let's, let's come down to Cardiff next, and then we'll, we'll finish up with, uh, with Tech Yin. So, Charlotte, maybe your turn to go first from the, 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 the Cardiff team. Yeah, I, I was just really going to echo what, what everybody had said. And I was, again, looking looking at my notes. And actually, one of the things that really struck me from the, from the data was actually how many of the women in our survey reported actually engaging with running because of that opportunity to enjoy the local area and to enjoy outdoors um, and, and to be able to explore with others, uh, with like-minded individuals. So I think that's a, a really nice, positive message to end on and to promote. Mm. Wonderful. Thank you, Charlotte. Sarah? And just to come in there, I mean, we 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 saw our participants not as um, not as engaging communities, but we saw them as as participants. We saw them as co-partners in understanding what the event was about. And we've talked a lot from a kind of a, a Cardiff-centric perspective, um, really going back and talking to your everyday communities about how they understand health and well-being, how they're experiencing this, is really what gave us, you know, both their creative kind of really amazing solutions that they were already had in place um, because everybody's kind of connected and doing lots of lots of amazing stuff but also it gave us a real sense of how they experience a city so rather than us assuming what we knew what running was like we actually just keeping coming back and seeing them as actual partners and knowledgeable experts on the local environment what what, what a great point how, how often do we uh, as human beings assume that we know what others want and, 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 and what, what um, makes them excited and enjoying things. R really great point, talking to your community, engaging. Take in the final word to you, please. Well, I just want to build on what everybody else has said. You know, running as an activity looks after part of movement, but running as a platform looks after social connection and the other mm -hmm. social determinants that lead to well-being. And the next big master planning initiative in Singapore is to look after the environment and what we call the healthy district. So your access to healthy food, your access to social groups that will support your lifestyle and, and really being able to reach out to those in particular uh, who tend to be isolated. Wonderful. Thank you. So many great, great uh, insights there. Singapore so often ahead of the curve. Thank you again, Tech Yin, for uh, joining us so soon after your flight back from London. Uh, thank you, Ted Metellus, for joining us from New York, Charlotte Brookfield and Sarah McBride-Stewart from Cardiff. And a big thanks to Jonas Larson for not only his presentation in the beginning, but uh, for joining us on the panel. Thank you for the rest of you that are joining us. Don't go away. We've, uh, we'll let the panel go away and relax and enjoy uh, the rest of their days. But uh, up next uh, we're ready to move on to our next section thanks again to all of the panel 
and uh, a big welcome as we head on to the next segment. We welcome Bob Ramsack, who's the head of sustainability at World Athletics, joining us from Monaco. And uh, we, we had a couple of questions in the chat earlier about sustainability and, and, and how does running tie into that. And, and there's some amazing initiatives afforded and have been for a while uh, with World Athletics. And we're going to hear from, from Bob on uh, an introduction to the World Athletics Sustainable Events Management System for Label Road Races. Hello there, Bob. Nice to see you. Thanks for joining us. Hi, Chris. Nice to be here. Thanks very much for the opportunity to talk a little bit about what we're doing in this space. Wonderful. I'm uh, going to disappear into the background and, and grab, a, grab a drink of water and uh, give you a screen share and let you drive the show for the next 25 minutes or so. 20 minutes, I think it is. Yep. Thanks, thanks Bob. Okay. Well, thanks again, Chris. And thank you, Alessio, for the opportunity to be here today. Uh, it's really a pleasure to join so many race and event organizers from around the world uh, to talk a little bit about what World Athletics is doing around sustainability and event delivery. Uh, we recently launched a sustainable event management system, which is a best practice guidance uh, geared toward event organizers, and uh, that we're encouraging race and event organizers uh, to pilot at their next editions. Uh, so the, the timing today really is spot on. Uh, many of you have already received an invitation to an introductory webinar we'll be conducting uh, uh, next week. So I look forward to seeing and speaking with uh, some of you there as well. Um, the system and the Athletics for Better World standard that sits alongside it is based upon and a central part of our sustainability strategy. So I want to begin by spending just a few minutes uh, introducing the strategy. Uh, but before I get started, I just want to emphasize that there is no one size fits all approach for any event delivery. I'm sure most of you already know that. Uh, we're all from different countries or regions or cities where local regulations, available services, and infrastructure play a key role in event delivery. Also, I, I know that some of you are already doing what's really best in class work in this area, uh, really pioneering work in sustainable event delivery. And others of you may be somewhat new to this. So my presentation today will take a slightly broader approach uh, to sustainability and event uh, delivery. So how does World Athletics as the governing body for track and field race walking and road running define sustainability uh, within athletics? We see it as driving the practice and behavior of individuals and organizations developing the sport in such a way that it accounts for the needs of future generations. It provides a fair level playing uh, sporting platform based on sound ethical principles. It needs to actively involve interested parties and is open about decisions and activities and ensures that actions take a balanced approach to their social, economic, and environmental impact. Uh, that required putting in place a robust sustainability strategy with a framework for developing tangible benefits across those three pillars, the environmental, the social, and the economic. So embracing those principles and practices in April 2020, we unveiled our sustainability strategy, which is a 10 year plan that provides a framework for the organization, for our member federations and event organizers on how to produce meaningful, tangible, and measurable results on environmental, social, and economic sustainability. Uh, that includes achieving carbon neutrality by 2030 across our HQ operations and in the delivery of the events that we own. Uh, we divided our strategy into six pillars, each of which contain actions and targets for the organization to pursue, uh, not just to reach our 2030 goals, but more broadly to guide how we operate in the future as we continue to embed principles of sustainability across our entire organization. Uh, the first is to show leadership sustainability, to be recognized as a driver, to be a recognized driver, excuse me, in sports sustainability by promoting sustainability across athletics and across sport in general. A large part of that means embedding sustainability principles into their, our events and into our sponsorship and partnership agreements. Second, the sustainable production and consumption uh, that means to positively manage the impacts of procurement. 
to make sure that we're minimizing any social or environmental impact from the procurement of those products and services, and that we maximize local economic impact around our events. Uh, the next is climate change and carbon, which I already mentioned, one of the main goals is to transition to carbon neutrality by 2030 across all of our operations. Uh, that also includes implementing a sustainable travel policy to reduce travel and to build local capacity so we don't need to travel as much uh, to ensure that all sanctioned events commit to carbon neutrality targets of their own and also to identify credible means to offset unavoidable emissions for us and for many of your events a large part of that is travel related uh, the next is local environment and air quality some of this was touched upon in the previous uh, discussion uh, we want to ensure environmental conditions that enable individuals to participate safely. Uh, much of that work is driven by our health and science team, um, who our sustainability team works uh, quite closely with. Uh, by the way, on that though, in June we will be launching, and we will be launching every breath we take, which is a three-year global awareness campaign around air quality and air pollution, which all of you will be invited to participate in. So please watch this space. Next is global equality. That's we want to demonstrate, excuse me, demonstrably share our skills across the world. And that includes creating and expanding recognized opportunity pathways for both genders in all professions and athletics across athletes, coaches, technical officials, administrators. And we also want to build technical event management and performance capabilities across a wider geography. And the sixth, diversity, accessibility, and well-being which basically ensures that athletics is and remains open to everyone. Uh, from the pillars, you can see how the strategy reaches and necessary involves each of our departments and something that requires buy-in across the organization. That's, as many of you already know, I'm sure extremely important in this space. Um, those elements need to become part of how you as an organization operates before it can be part of the events that you organize. So why are we doing this? Because we are an international federation and we're putting on and licensing events during a global climate crisis. It is an existential crisis. The science on this is very clear. We see it impacting our communities. We see the impact in our events and we can't ignore that. We need to acknowledge that our events do have an impact on the environment and need to be seen as a sport collectively trying to do something concrete and meaningful to address it. Another reason is that our athletes want us to. I've been doing a lot of surveying over the past year. 80% of athletes surveyed at our race walking team championships in Oman last month said they're either extremely concerned or very concerned about climate change. 76% said that climate change has already impacted them directly. Nearly 81% said that climate change has impacted our sport, something that you are, I'm sure, very well aware of. And 93% said that sport of athletics should do more to help build a sustainable future. Uh, these are similar to the numbers we found from surveys we conducted leading up to the COP26 UN Climate Change Summit last November and at our World Athletics Indoor Championships in Belgrade a few weeks ago. Um, some of you also know that sponsors want sport to address this crisis as well. It's no longer enough to merely put on an exciting sporting event. Our events must include meaning and purpose for sponsors to show interest. I hear that from just about every meeting organizer that I speak with. So we have to use our biggest asset in this fight, which is our influence as a sport. Our events, and most importantly, our athletes can reach and influence millions of people around the world. And that's where our power to drive positive change exists. That influence is packaged in the examples that we set, the way we stage our competitions, the community partnerships we forge, the commercial sponsors that we choose to associate with. So now getting into the sustainable event management system, which is how we are going to set about doing some of these things. Or how are we going to set about, excuse me, how are we going to do this? Uh, by working to embed principles of sustainability into the delivery of the events that we own, like our world championship events, and those that we sanction or license 
like the World Athletics label road races, and to provide guidance to you as organizers to help you deliver more sustainable events. Uh, to do that, we've developed two tools that I mentioned. First is a sustainable event management system, which we call a SEMS, uh, which provides best practice guidance for organizers to incorporate into their event planning and implementation. And the second, an event standard, which we're calling the Athletics for a Better World Standard, which will be a, sc a scorecard of sorts, which includes a set of expectations based upon the guidance, which will measure the event's level of achievement in sustainable practice. The Sustainable Event Management System Best Practice Guidance has been developed to provide a clear actionable checklist aligning to a plan, do, check, act sort of framework. And it's broken down into 16 sustainability topics or chapters. Each of those chapters are broken down into actions that should be taken during event planning, during event delivery, and in the post-event washing. Uh, each section can be extracted and distributed to team members as appropriate, which empowers them to deliver their role responsibly according to best practice. Uh, begins, as you saw, with advice on how to develop your sustainability plan. and also includes chapters to cover just about every component of a successful event delivery, including procurement, waste management, energy, food, water management, travel and accommodation planning, uh, waste chapter on diversity, accessible inclusion, health, safety, and well-being, monitoring, and then finally reporting and communication, because it's also really important to get the word out about the work we're doing, why we're doing it, and also to share some of the successes we've achieved. And again, as I said, there is no one-size-fits-all package, but we did endeavor to make it relevant and applicable across as wide a, a geography as possible and as wide a range of um, events as possible. And then there is the Athletics for a Better World Standard. Uh, it's a checklist. We've broken down into the six pillar areas of our sustainability strategy, and which is then further broken down into a number of delivery areas within each of the pillars. So each of those uh, will be assigned a set number of points. Uh, the standard will be scalable so that any event at any level, from a local park run or small 5K, all the way to a world championship or a major marathon should be able to achieve the highest standard of sustainable event achievement. Uh, we're also going to make it tiered. We'll have gold, silver, and bronze levels at the start, and then eventually we'll be adding a platinum uh, level as well. Now, just to be clear, uh, the intent here isn't to make this so difficult that your events fail. Uh, it's to get those events that haven't yet started to begin their journey and to help others continually improve on the foundations they've already built. Uh, some actions will be mandatory, such as developing a formal sustainable event plan, uh, having a waste management plan in place, uh, calculating your event's carbon footprint, for example. Uh, that doesn't mean that you need to have a 64-page strategy, but you will need one that addresses each of the key delivery areas and is detailed enough that it helps you set an action plan uh, to meet clear targets and objectives. Uh, the standard will also be incorporated into the bidding process for all of our World Championships events, beginning with the events that will open later this year. And those will require a commitment to a gold level delivery, uh, which is where your events come in. Uh, we're encouraging, as I said, all of our championship events, uh, track meets from our one day meeting series, and uh, label road races like yours to pilot the system this year. It's especially important that events with experience in the space, and I know there are many of you, uh, give the standard a spin this year as well. I'll, I'll be in touch with you separately about that. Uh, that will really go a long way in helping us determine what the different levels of achievement should be, and quite frankly, how realistic uh, what we're trying to setting, set out to do really is in the long term. Um, why is it important to pilot this year? I realize this has been a lot to take in to consider and digest, but it's important that you begin with your next edition. Uh, for most of that, that means this year. And by begin, I mean by taking a look at the standard, setting aside a little time and filling it in. Why? First, to see where you stand. There are probably delivery areas you are already strong in and may not even realize it. And it's useful to identify those. Second, to measure your impact and collect whatever data you can. Third, 
to set targets moving forward. And fourth, to help set the levels of the standards, like I said, when it's implemented in 2023. In other words, the points that will be required for gold level, silver, and bronze. And that will take a lot of feedback uh, from organizers that we work with. Um, and finally, this will always be an evolving process. The levels for 2024 may be more easily achievable and then raised for 2026, for example. Uh, what's most important is that you do begin the process, first by measuring your impact and then continually striving to improve. Uh, this next slide just has a few more resources that I wanted to share and point out. We'll be publishing detailed stories about each of these delivery areas that are mentioned in the management system. Uh, they'll be published on our website. They'll be updated regularly with best case examples. So I really want this to be up to the minute, really the most recent um, kind of information and make that available to everyone. So if there's any of you who have any examples or experiences from your events that you'd like to share with the wider world, please, by all means, let us know and we'll include them there as well. Uh, finally, just to close, there's really no need to reinvent the wheel here. Uh, you can learn and share experiences from each other. You can figure out ways to collaborate as well. Um, an increasing number of sports and teams are figuring out creative ways to reduce their impact and grow their influence in the space. And we really must become a major part of that. And we just have a few minutes left. I'm happy to answer any questions you may have, but I also believe that Alessio just wanted to add a few comments uh, before we open the floor. Yeah, thanks, Bob. No, I just wanted to restate what I typed in the in the chat from 2023. Well, good morning or afternoon, first of all. From 2023, um, there will be in the label, in the World Athletics label standard, a certain commitment to sustainability that races will have to demonstrate, just like today they do have an elite race or a particular level of TV distribution, as it was the case in the past. In 2023, there will be something about sustainability. However, see this as a, as a sort of menu from which race organizers will have the ability to choose what matters to them, what's relevant in their geography, what their sponsors want, what is sensible in their, in the context of their local government. Obviously, the higher the label, the more these actions that will need to be put in place, but it will not be a, you know, here's the standard, this is what you have to do. And if you fail, you are out of the system. It will always be progressive. Thanks, Bob. Over to you for the questions. Thanks there, um, Alessio and Bob. Uh, Bob, there's a couple of questions for you there. Let me just pick them out of the chat. Uh, from Tracy Sunderland. Hi, Tracy. How do you balance reducing travel to ensure carbon neutrality with the goal of growing the economic impact of, of our events, especially our road races around the world? Yeah, it's, it's a difficult question. Um, we're grappling really every day with the travel question. For us, it's more than 80% of our, of our impact comes from travel as an international federation. You know, we are, our events are held over, all over the world. We, you know, there are our next world championship event next year, we'll have, you know, 2000 people traveling to Eugene, Oregon from over 200 countries. So we have to make some tough choices in how we reduce travel, first of all. Uh, and, but this really is one of those big events, oh, one of those big, components that we mentioned uh, earlier about offsets. We have to find an offset partner uh, to help us compensate for the travel. I mean, there really is no easy answer to, to that question. It's one that every every event organizer grapples with, but that's that's going to be our strategy as a as an international federation to find a partner helping uh, who, who's willing to help us uh, help with the compensation of that. Thanks, Bob. Yeah, and like you say, it it is it's 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 something that so many people are wrestling with, isn't it? It's uh, you know, and uh, as, as we've moved out of COVID, many events have become localized, but surely there's going to be an opportunity with a with a hunger for people to travel to come back to these events, and many of them are, are destination events that rely on tourism. So finding that partner, 
um, is, is going to be key. Thank you for, for answering that one. There's another one which I think is, is fairly simple. It's Laurent Petit, if I pronounce it r r correctly. How can young projects start up that provide solution to bring more sustainability in the sport of running can be considered by WA. What, what we'll do, uh, Laurent, we'll connect you with, uh, with Alessio um, and then Alessio can take that forward with Bob and, and, and introduce you if, if, uh, if appropriate. Um, Alessio has put some comments in there. Uh, Steve Fleck, uh, Tracy are offering carbon offsets to travel or programs like planting a trees for flights, races enough. I ask, but these seem to be popular now. Um, how would you, you like to pick that one yeah, up? Yeah, I mean, off? there are, sure, well, from my experience, there, there are different programs that offer different things. Um, if you're looking for some, if you're looking for certified offsets, this is looking at quite a, a sort of a, a complex um, kind of topic here, but if you're looking for what are referred to as certified um, offsets, which can be part, let's say you're, you're, you're going for a certain certification, you will require offsets that are certified, right? Those are more expensive kind of offsets. So that will require a big, uh, a larger investment. Um, we're uh, speaking of uh, planting trees, we're, we're, we're uh, now partnering on a project with an organization called One Tree Planet, uh, which is a uh, donor funded uh, NGO in the US which they offer, they plant one tree for every dollar donated. So this is one way to, we're hoping to engage a lot of fans in this project. We're, we're, we're doing this with a project in Jamaica at the moment to welcome back uh, the Carifta Games after a two year postponement. The Carifta Games are a big uh, U20 competition, really one of the best uh, U20 competitions in the world. And it's, it's really central to the Caribbean um, athletic experience. Uh, so this is one way we're trying to get fans and athletes engaged on that. And that centers around trees and a very specific reforestation project uh, in, in Jamaica. So I am sorry, but I really have to go because I have a, a two, two minutes. I have another presentation that I have to be a part of. So uh, no, you have no, my address. No worries so at all, really, Bob. Uh, yeah. Let you go. Thanks. Thanks for joining us. Um, and uh, good luck with your next presentation. <laughs> Wonderful, wonderful initiative. All the best with it. Thanks very much. And, uh, and as Bob uh, logs off, there's a question there from Eugene. Uh, Eugene, we will pick that one up and come back to you. I'll check in uh, with, uh, with Alessio. Um, my, my sense, um, and, and I'm not uh, across all the details here, but you know, my, my sense was that this is going to be a kind of a pilot benchmarking year. Um, I didn't get the sense that it had to be audited, but let me, let me check with you and, and, and come back to you with that. I know that there, uh, you know, there are a number of different organizations giving the, these opportunities for self-audit. Um, but, but let, let, let us come back to you and confirm that. As we move on to the final lap tonight, thank you for staying with us. Uh, we've had uh, great attendance. Uh, we had uh, nearly 300 people registered for the webinar, um, and, uh, and many of you have stuck with us to this final lap, uh, which was, uh, was going to be live, um, but we, we ended up having to pre-record it a couple of days ago uh, because Dr. Michael Crawley, social anthropologist at Durham University, had a conflicting engagement that he needed to get to but it's a wonderful conversation I was I was lucky enough to be sitting listening to the recording I'd encourage you to stay the distance on this one some amazing uh, insights not only on Ethiopian runners but some practical tips uh, for your event in terms of how you might engage with international elite runners and and indeed recreational runners city of opportunities the Ethiopian elite runners mindset uh, a conversation between Dr. Michael Crawley and Alessio Punzi, as you all know, the road running manager at World Athletics. Enjoy the next 25 minutes and I'll come back and wrap up the show at the end of it. Well, thank you, Chris, and welcome, Michael. It's a pleasure to see you again. Uh, you too. Thank you very much for having me. Uh, Michael and I go back a few years. We met on the occasion of the uh, World Athletics, well, then IWF. World Half Marathon Championships in Valencia, where Michael did the, the keynote speech, actually. It was about the uh, same type of research that we're going to talk today, except that in this in these four years, the research has morphed into a best-selling book, Out of Thin Air, uh, Running Wisdom and Magic from Above the Clouds in Ethiopia. Michael, the book is great, but let's uh, first talk about you. Who are you? Uh, so I'm a social anthropologist um, based in Durham, at Durham University. Um, I yeah, I spent 15 months basically in Ethiopia researching 
the book, but it was for um, a PhD project that I was doing uh, initially. But um, I guess my relationship with running goes back a lot further than that. I was I've been running competitively since I was about 14. So I guess more than half of my life at this stage. Um, so the, the book is kind of uh, also, um, yeah, sort of responds to, to that as well, I guess. Mm -hmm. And it's called Out of Thin Air. Why is that? Uh, it's called Out of Thin Air for, for two reasons, really. The first one is that obviously we have these like, this idea that a lot of the success of um, East African runners is because of um, the altitude that they're, they're born and live at. Um, but also, I think it's sort of a, a play on this idea that we we think that Ethiopian and Kenyan runners sort of just appear out of thin air as if from nowhere, um, that we don't really know that much about them. And so that was why that was kind of what motivated me really to write the book. I wanted to um, to write something that kind of brought the stories of um, of Ethiopian runners, at a, a variety of different levels of the sport to life uh, and tried to sort of um, explain how the world looks from their perspective uh, a little bit more than mm -hmm. than has been done. Um, in the yeah. past, basically. No, fascinating. And certainly, they, if you read the book and see the amount of water they put into, you will understand that they do not come out of the... Uh, um, Michael, Ethiopia is a huge country, 115 million population, and one of the fastest growing countries on planet Earth right now. Approximately, this is probably not the specificity of your research, but approximately, how many people are making a living from the sport? Who, what would you say from the sport? Um, running? I think... Uh, probably some running sort of consistently in international races. I think probably somewhere between 500 and a thousand, um, maybe a few more than a thousand, but not, not that many more. I wouldn't have thought I'm not, I'm not hundred percent sure I should say, but it's, um, quite a small fraction of the number of people who are actually sort of engaged in running in Ethiopia, uh, mm. I think who are actually making and, a uh, Okay. And what would that uh, number be then? The broader number of people engaged in running in Ethiopia? Broader number, um, running competitively, I would have thought, um, not 100% sure, but at least in sort of 10,000, something like that, I would have thought. Because um, I think one of the things people, you know, the stereotypes of East African running often are of people running sort of barefoot to and from school um, and sort of becoming good athletes that way, um, sort of outside of any kind of um, institutional structure, I guess. And so what I was... Uh, one of the things that kind of surprised me a little bit in Ethiopia was that there's this huge amount of institutional support actually for athletics, uh, a load of different levels. So you've got um, athletics in schools, but then you've got loads and loads of regional training camps all around Amhara region and Aromia. Um, and so there's a huge number of people who are actually just sort of supported to run more or less full time. So from quite a young age, so teenagers um, up mm -hmm. into um, to sort of early 20s where people are sort of given somewhere to live given a, a structure where they can just focus on their athletics and that the number of people who for whom that is true is probably in the at least in the thousands um, mm -hmm. yeah and if you, if you take these 500 to 1000 Ethiopians who made it to, to the big time to the uh, big city marathons worldwide for each of them who makes it how many don't I would say a, a good, at least a hundred. I would have thought. Okay, so we really are seeing the, the top. Of and, and more, more than that, if you count the people who sort of have a go at running for just a few months, you know, I saw that in in Addis. One of the things that was interesting was that I would just go running, you know, in the forest above where I lived, and you'd have every people from uh, basically people who were construction workers or had some sort of manual job in Addis mm -hmm. um, who just had kind of seen runners and were interested in, and therefore had gone to the forest and started training all the way through to you know people like um, Jamal Yima who I write about in the book um, who's the Ethiopian record holder for the half marathon so but all of the, the, the forests have that kind of people from all different levels including mm -hmm. people who are just sort of giving it a go for a, a short amount of time mm -hmm. but even those people I think that who are um just getting started in the sport, they have this aspiration and this idea in the back of their minds that maybe one day they'll become as successful as someone like Jamal. Um, there aren't, there isn't so much of a culture of just kind of mass participation running in Ethiopia, apart from for the, the great Ethiopian run, I wouldn't have thought at this stage. Now, a broad question, and the, if you give me the answer to the angle you prefer, what motivates them? Uh, so what people, what everybody basically said was that they were running to change their lives. Um, and that meant that, you know, 
broadly speaking, people were motivated by um, by economic uh, motivations. Basically, people said, "I want to, um, I want to be able to support my family. I want to be able to get married, build a house, be able to support myself um, after my running career is is finished." So that was the the main motivation. But I do think that people. Um, I was writing about this the other day in an article. I think the the reason there are that Ethiopia had so much more success um, on the track in the world indoors than, than Kenya is probably because people still have this real sense of wanting to do well on the track. And I think that's, whilst there's a little bit less money, obviously in track running at the moment, I think people still have this sense that um, track running is important because of it's kind of the history of track running in Ethiopia with Haile Gebre Selassie and Bekele and people like that. So um, I think there's also this sense of kind of national pride and wanting to do something that um, that reflects well on Ethiopia as well. And well, in the book, a big big chunk of the book is you describing basically the daily lives of these athletes uh, from a, from the inside. You've been training with them, living with them, eating with them. Uh, yeah. I hope you you don't mind if I say that most of the times they were running ahead of you, given how talented <laughs> yeah. they are. Even though Michael, you are no. Uh, amateur athlete, you're no recreational athlete yourself. You also have some uh, some quite good performances under your name. Uh, what would a their average day look like? Um, so we we would get up three days a week at about four thirty in the morning um, in order to take a bus that took us basically outside of Addis Ababa um, to training locations around the city. Um, and that was because people believed really strongly in this idea that um, you needed to kind of harness different environmental. Um, resources in order to do well so people would like to go to in toto sometimes at really high altitudes uh, sort of 3,000 meters above sea level uh, to do slow runs and then other days we would take a bus down to somewhere called Akaki which is much much warmer more like 2,000 meters above sea level and we'd go down there to do the kind of fast uh, speed sessions um, so there was this idea that it was important to to move around to get not only um, access to different altitudes, but also different kind of temperatures of running environments and different surfaces underfoot. Um, so those days we'd get up at 4.30, we sometimes wouldn't get back um, home until midday because we'd sit in traffic all the way back um, into Addis Ababa afterwards. Um, then people would generally sort of eat lunch, then kind of sleep for a decent part of the afternoon and then do another training session about 4.30 in the afternoon, um, which would be more kind of slow jogging to recuperate from the morning session. And then on days when we didn't take the bus anywhere, we would train usually twice a day as well, um, but have a lie-in until about 5.30 in the morning um, in order to start running when the sun came up basically at six. But on those days we would train, uh, I lived in Kotebe, which is a, a suburb of Addis. And we would just walk from there into the forests, Yeka sub-city forests where you can run, um, in the kind of between the eucalyptus trees basically all the way up into the mountains from there um so that would be and then mostly sundays people did people didn't tended not to train on a sunday for religious reasons so we normally train six days a week, like that. Six a week. twice yeah. a day yeah uh, michael this webinar today is, is about running and the city running in the city and one one could wonder may wonder why we're having you well but my thought process was in Ethiopia, differently from Kenya, it's uh, often reported that athletes prefer to live in big cities as opposed to uh, camps in the, in the countryside, in the mountains, on the hills, uh, because there is a sense that they can get more opportunities there. Is it because, because of habit? Is it because of um, the way this support structure, support structure works? Why do Kenyan, Ethiopian athletes prefer living in big cities? Um, yeah, you're right. I mean, basically all of the top athletes in Ethiopia live in Addis. Um, and that's, yeah, basically just because that's where the opportunities are with managers. So the general trajectory of an athlete would be to start off in a rural training camp um, somewhere. Most of the runners that I knew were from um, up in the north of Ethiopia in kind of Gondar region. Mm -hmm. And if they did well from the local training camp, they would then um, go to a regional training camp, which is usually a bit closer to Addis. And then eventually the sort of end game of the process is to end up in Addis Ababa, um, working with a manager in order to be able to access races abroad. It's very much more difficult than in Kenya, I think, to, to live somewhere more, um, more rural and still get access to races, which is in many ways a bit of a shame because people did say that living in Addis is something of a compromise, really. It's not, it's not necessarily the best place to train because it's quite busy it's 
um, uh, it's noisy, you've got to and go in the bus to get people. to training, it's expensive. So um, I'm kind of in some ways surprised that there isn't a, um, a center a bit more like E10 in Ethiopia, because Bakoji is where a lot of the runners come from. And I write, write about Bakoji in the book, it's where um, Kenanisa Bekele and Tiranesh Dibaba are from. Um, that could become a hub, I guess, of where there's there's more kind of managers and uh, people involved sort of directly in Bakoji, but it seems like the trend in Ethiopia has just been for everybody to move to the city, basically. Mm -hmm. um, and go city with 17,000 people, which has produced how many world champions and record holders? It's pretty incredible. Uh, I, I think it was uh, 17 last time I counted, but it's probably gone up since then. <laughs> okay. Uh, you mentioned you mentioned managers. Now, in world athletic jargon, we call them AR, athletic representatives, yeah. and they are part of the support structure that basically scouts, nurtures, and brings Ethiopian athletes to the world stage. Can you tell us more about that? Because we often say, we often hear when we work with these managers that they have sub agents in Ethiopia. How that structure, how that support structure work? Yeah. Um, so yeah, as I said before, most most athletes um, come through the training camps and end up in Addis. Normally, when they when they arrive, they do so because they've they've got a contract to run for one of the first division clubs in Ethiopia, which is basically like um, the sort of Premier League of running clubs in in the country. So uh, most of those are sponsored by um, entities like the um, Ethiopian Commercial Bank or the Cement Factory or the the Army or the Police, um, and so those clubs give pe pay people a salary. Uh, that's enough to live off in a month to pay their rent and things. They normally give them somewhere where they can go for meals as well. Um, so I knew a lot of runners from a club called Merbrat Heil, which is the electric corporation. And they would um, they would be able to go to the electricity corporation to have lunch with the workers there and things. So there's this this whole structure of club running. Like in Japan. In, like in Japan. Was. So yes, exactly. So there's a structure of club running and the clubs take this... Um, it's it's a really serious business for the clubs because they sponsor they they sort of employ um, athletes or have running teams in order to kind of increase their own prestige and so the athletes are expected to run a certain number of races domestically in that is for the club every year and then on top of that structure you have the managers who are or athlete, athlete representatives as you say who are primarily um, European or American and who basically arrange races abroad for for athletes so organize visas organize flights um organize the terms of the contracts with races um but most of those managers are not in ethiopia for very many weeks of the year basically so you have um really it's the sub agents who are primarily ethiopian who are on the ground who do most of the a lot of the decision making about which athletes will go to races and things like that so their mm -hmm. their role is really crucial um and I kind of, I kind of got to know that that role really well because I lived in a compound when I was doing my field work with an with a um, sub agent of Moyo Sports Management. Um, so I was able to really learn about his role in the whole process, which was basically everything from um, being the kind of confidant of the athletes, working out what kind of races they wanted to run, trying to work out what made them tick, uh, and liaising between them and the coaches and the manager. And then also accompanying them to kind of visa interviews, going to embassies, making sure they got to the airport on time, all these kinds of things. So they have a, I think the sub agents have this really, really important role to play in all this. Um, but yeah, the managers sit on top of that, basically organizing the, um, negotiating with the races and, and things. Michael, most of the people we have on, online today for this webinar would be, I guess, race organizers. and. Many of them are, are experienced. They've been working with elite, with international, mainly East African elite athletes for decades. Others are uh, new to the World Athletics label system, which is the international circuit for the sport. Um, the system is, is organized in such a way that, at least in the non-COVID era, races need to have a certain level of elite competition to qualify for labels. This means that a number of race organizers have started also, uh, thanks to a push from World Athletics, to stage uh, world-class international competitions at home and they may not necessarily know how to best uh, how to best work with these athletes now knowing what you know about Ethiopian running culture and, and their habits and what makes them perform at, at the best of their ability if you could single out for me like three or four recommendations for race organizers for elite athletes coordinator how do I if I'm a race organizer how do I 
put my athletes, my Ethiopian athletes, in the best possible condition to express their full potential. Yeah, great question. Um, so most of the runners that I knew uh, were very against running on the roads, apart from in races and in very fast training sessions. So basically, if you've got a group of um, East African athletes in a hotel uh, for two or three days before a race, best thing to do is to, to make sure you've got somewhere where they can run on grass or in a forest or somewhere that's not on a really hard surface. So that would be, that'd be the first thing, take people somewhere, you know, really kind of think quite carefully about where um what kind of facilities you have in order to, to allow people to train um, the second thing i would do would be to think carefully about how you can help the athletes to communicate with the public um, in as direct a way as, as they can because most ethiopian athletes are quite happy to do that um, and they but they need they often need a little bit of help just because primarily they speak amharic they might speak some english but often what i see is that the um even with athletes like someone like Solomon Borrega, whose English is very good, if you ask a really kind of convoluted question in an interview, it's still going to be difficult for him to pick up exactly what you're asking him. So if I was, um, if I was doing that, what I would do is I would make sure I phrase the question in a way that's easy to understand, but also probably um, just let him know what I'm going to ask him five minutes before I actually record the interview. Um, so that would be, that'd be another thing. Um, and then I think what, you, what what's possible is just to kind of liaise with the managers a little bit more around social media with athletes, because um, I think increasingly Ethiopian and Kenyan athletes are sort of, uh, do have Instagram and Twitter accounts and things, but they, um, they sort of often use them in conjunction with their manager or they're mainly um, controlled by the manager, but people are increasingly um, understanding the benefits of doing that. I think that's, that's also another thing that I think um we could be doing more generally whether it's a job of the, the managers or the races or, or who i'm not sure but basically um trying to explain to athletes the benefits of using these kinds of things um for their own careers and, for, and financially in terms of when they're negotiating contracts with brands and things i think often ethiopian and kenyan athletes don't really realize uh that they can make more money if they're using instagram and that if they're actually engaged with that so helping athletes social media make... which is the biggest uh, social media in ethiopia because I guess a country um, of over 150 million, can def- you can definitely definitely create a follow there for the athletes. What do they use? Yeah, I mean most of, most of the athletes tend to use Facebook uh, yes. primarily, but a lot of a lot of the runners now are starting to use Instagram and Twitter and things as well because they've they're beginning to realize that it's important for their their careers. But there's not that much. I just think there could be more in the way of training for pe- for athletes and how to use those and how to use them to their advantage. Um, but to go back to to the races specifically, I think. Most big cities will have um, an Ethiopian diaspora population as well, where you'll have people who can speak Amharic and English or Afanaromo in English. And I would suggest reaching out to those communities and trying to find somebody who can come and help to, to interpret in interviews in order to allow people to express themselves in their own language. Um, I think that's really important. And it's also good for the, I think, races I've been at where there has been a um, diaspora population, the athletes feel much more comfortable in the environment when there's other Ethiopians around who, who come to, and it's a really nice connection between the elite athletes and, and Ethiopians who live in um, Istanbul, for example, when I was there, it was like, there was a really nice little community of people. Um, so I think that can really help athletes to, to feel comfortable, but also to be able to express themselves. Um, and then I think, yeah, one, one thing that to remember about Ethiopians specifically is that people don't really like one of the worst things that you can seen, be seen to be in um, in Amhara culture is arrogant. <laughs> so being asked to speak in a way that is very kind of um, self-aggrandizing in interviews is, can be quite difficult for people. So if you can avoid, uh, avoid uh, pushing people into saying things that, um, that make them feel uncomfortable as well, that, that can help. In terms of food, what kind of food do I have to prepare to make sure that they feel comfortable? Uh, Food-wise... Um, I mean, most athletes grow up eating primarily uh, injera, which is a, a kind of specifically Ethiopian kind of pancake bread made of teff flour. But when they move to the city, they get used to eating rice and pasta and, um, and things like that. So uh, just, I think I would make sure there's kind of pasta and vegetables, rice and vegetables, things like that, quite easily to, easy to digest stuff, nothing too um, 
yeah it's some i mean they, they're very used to eating spicy food but when i was in china um people were i think quite keen to try to get some food that was just a little bit um less likely to upset their stomachs i guess than, mm -hmm. than what they would give so like rice and rice and vegetables and things people generally avoid meat just before a race so um kind of depends but yeah um rice and pasta same i think that's probably true of all athletes around the world right but Michael, what about the Ethiopian names? Now, our statisticians, from time to time, they, they really go crazy trying to sort out who's raised where, because Ethiopian names can come in different combinations. But reading your book, I realized that it can really be simple. Tell us about that. Yeah, it should be really simple. Um, basically, people have a given name, which is the name they're given when they're born. So if you take Kenanisa Bekele, his name is Kenanisa. Very and Bekele is his father's name, his father's given name. And then... Sometimes people have other names after that. And if, if they do, it's their grandfather's given name after that. And then so, so basically, the um, simplest way to do it is just to use the first name that you're given. So, so put the uh, first name on the bit, because Kenan is yeah, Kenan I would not just say, yeah, uh, it's kind of, um, I would just, yeah, it, first name on the bib would be the best way forward. But the trouble is that there's no real standards convention, it seems. So, yeah, people, I've seen the same athlete with three or four different things on the bib at different races, which is really... Tell me about it, Michael. becomes difficult to build a narrative around an athlete when their name is constantly changing. <laughs> yeah, that's another thing. Media should really be, be taught to do... A, uh, specialized media have really improved when it comes to, to telling stories of, uh, of this athlete. But all too often we see generalist media referring to the East Africans or in some cases even... Yeah, yeah. I, I really think that that's something that um, athlete representatives could be involved in uh, a little bit more. Just basically, uh, there's one thing that we did, I did with Malcolm from Moyo Sports a little bit when I was um, working alongside him, was to just send, um, send races just a page of information about, about all the athletes. So, you know, where they went to school, where they're from, a couple of things that they're interested in, just some, the kind of... Um, colorful details that you would have for most European or American athletes. Uh, it would be very easy for athlete representatives to just put those documents together for all of their athletes. And then uh, it helps the commentators to, to sort of, um, yeah, to give those athletes a bit more of a personality. I think that would be really good. Michael, we have to wrap up in a couple of minutes, but before we go, I really have one curiosity, one question. Uh, now, in our Western culture, the loneliness of the long distance runner is often mythicized. We would like to think of, of Martin as his people who individually they battle the, battle the elements and out of willpower uh, come out on top of uh, challenges. Whereas reading your book, I realized that in, in Ethiopia, things are quite different. Running is more seen as a, as a collective endeavor. And this probably explains why often you see them uh, saying things like, let's work together, follow me. Tell us about that. How does that work? Yeah. Um, so people, yeah, people had this very strong sense that you have to be embedded in this group environment toward, in order to improve. So success is kind of collectively produced by being in that environment. So one thing that I, it took me a while to get used to is that people actually, um, when you're running sort of fast training sessions on asphalt, for example, people will run actually in time synchronized with each other. Yeah. Um, their feet will be like literally just in, in sync. Um, and so people think that that's, a real way of kind of sharing energy between people. So I think, yeah, it's a very different idea rather than thinking of, um, of energy and potential as being kind of bounded within an individual body. They think of energy as something that can be kind of shared between people. So it was very important. Nobody, everybody said, you know, in order to be changed, in order to improve, you've got to be together in a group. Um, so yeah, that was, it was very, very important. Yeah, fascinating. I read that they were pointed at, at their heels when running as uh, so as to prompt you to follow them you know, follow literally follow my yeah, yeah. footstep running my footsteps yeah exactly as soon as a little gap opened up between me and the person in front which did happen pretty often <laughs> when i got left behind who would sort of click their finger and be and say come on you know you got to be right on my heels and then then we'll be fine yeah fascinating michael uh we are at the well no, no longer at the beginning but in the middle of a beautiful marathon season here in the in the northern hemisphere and we look forward to seeing many more performances from uh Ethiopian, but also Kenyan and uh, other, other business runners at the very many marathons part of our global calendar. Michael, thank you. Uh, your book is available on Amazon and a number of outlets, out of thin air, running wisdom and magic from the clouds in Ethiopia. Hope to cross paths soon in person, Michael. It was a pleasure yeah, to have you great. with us today. Thank you very much. Thank you. Over to you, Chris. 
Huge apologies. We had a drop off there, completely lost our internet. Um, whilst you're watching this recording, that would be quite seamless. But apologies for those that were still online and, and watching live. Uh, we've dropped in the full recording between Michael and um, Alessio, and you would have watched that by the time you hear me now. Uh, a big thank you for joining. Um, sorry for what was otherwise a seamless program ending with a cutoff there. I know Alessio jumped in and, uh, and, uh, and finished up the show. Um, wonderful program. Thanks to our speakers. A uh, great journey starting at the top of the show in New York with uh, Ben Burchak and some really amazing insights into Facebook and Instagram. Uh, amazing. Uh, never realized that more running Facebook groups than there are groups around the NBA basketball. Uh, some great opportunities there for further commercialization uh, in terms of, you know, the simple thing of, uh, of live streaming your finish line on Facebook and opportunities to sell uh, advertising and sponsorship uh, with some of the tools that Facebook have, which we will make available to you. Uh, then a, a, a great presentation by Professor Jonas Larson and, uh, and then a segue into the panel, What Makes a Running City? Um, and clearly lots and lots of takeaways there, some really great insights from an academic perspective and then from an implementation on the ground perspective and policy with um, Ted Metalis from New York Marathon, race director of New York Marathon and, and Mr. Lim Tekian, the CEO of Sports Singapore. Uh, and one of the key things that came out of that is the huge role that running cities have as we move uh, beyond the COVID pandemic. Um, and then a wonderful session with Bob Ramsack sharing the new um, uh, World Athletic Sustainable Event Management System um, and a big encouragement for those of you that can to pilot that system. These things all have to start somewhere, but a great initiative. Congratulations, World Athletics, obviously something that's very well needed. Um, and then we finished up with that interview that was cut short when you were watching live, but hopefully you've watched uh, now to get here the recording, uh, I guess, metaphorically speaking, in thin air in Ethiopia, albeit uh, recorded with, um, uh, with Michael out of Durham and Alessio in, uh, the, in, the, in um, the World Athletics offices in Monaco. A big thank you for joining us. Uh, if, if you missed any of this, it is still on the MPW Facebook page as we've been streaming live. The recording will be distributed as well. Um, and uh, yeah, just a quick shout out for the next MPW Global Updates happening on the second and fourth Tuesday of every month. So our next one is the 26th of April, a very quick 15, 16 minute global update live on Facebook and LinkedIn and then trans uh, transcribed into um, a podcast within 24 hours. Uh, until the next one, look forward to seeing you. I'm Chris Robb, the CEO and founder of Mass Participation World. It's been a great pleasure to be your host tonight, a wonderful program, and look forward to seeing you on the next one.